Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. If you want to be a pro here, all you gotta do is hit those like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our first story of the day is by I love you. A lady refused to cut my hair based on my appearance. For context, I like to wear my clothes until they're worn out. I have money, but I don't spend it unless I really want or need to. Money usually goes towards my groceries, bills, etc. My clothes don't look torn apart, but you can tell they're old. I wear old pants, old shoes, old shirts, all clean, just well worn. I decided to go to a salon for the first time just out of curiosity. I usually cut my own hair, but I wanted to try something new. I signed in, sat down, and waited. The lady, who I assumed was going to be the original person to cut my hair, takes a glance at me and turns around to one of her co-workers. Without even lowering her voice, tells her, I'm not cutting her hair. I walked in with very clean hair. I was clean. My hair's kind of short, and it was all brushed out and good before I walked in. She continued telling her that she didn't want to cut my hair because I was cheap and thought she'd be lucky to get free stuff here. I didn't know they did free things for newcomers anyway. Just wanted a haircut, you know? Well, their coworker cuts my hair instead. We have a nice talk, and I end up with a lovely haircut. She was one of the sweetest people I've ever met. On top of paying for my haircut, I look at her and tell her, Here, I want you to have this. This is yours. Don't give it to anyone else. And gave her a $50 tip. The other woman saw all of that and looked angry as heck. The lady who cut my hair thanked me, and she looked overjoyed. That was the best $50 I've ever spent. Seeing the first woman's angry expression made my whole year. I'm not so cheap after all, huh? If somebody talked down about you like this, would you want to spite them and give that person a really good tip? Maybe even try to make it apparent to that one person that stiffed you? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Randaluminium. Sincerely forgot a bully's name and called her something totally wrong, then thanked her for getting me fired. I don't know if this is actually revenge, but a comment I made in a different sub reminded me of this event from 20 years ago, and it feels a little like harmless revenge to me. I worked at a small satellite office, nine staffers, of a much larger organization headquartered elsewhere. The place was a seething snake pit of office politics, and the parent org was even worse. From the first day, everyone gossiped about everyone else to me, so I didn't tell them anything I could avoid telling them because I knew anything I said would be immediately told to everyone in the office and weaponized when they wanted to use it. I did assume anyone who spent 5 minutes with me would know or at least suspect I'm gay. I was 40 something, not married, not macho, etc. But a trio of my women co-workers decided that since I was single and didn't look like a player, I must be a virgin, and it was fun for them to try to make me blush. Thus, lots of sexual jokes and innuendo. Apparently it was their job to tease me into, I'm not sure what, go hook up with a woman? I would just walk away and never speak to them about anything not work-related and absolutely necessary. I'd been there 8 months, and I knew that I wouldn't last a year. They decided to go full on mean girls and file multiple complaints about me, but there wasn't anything to complain about that was an actual infraction. So eventually one of them lied to HR and said I called our boss the old see you next Tuesday. Right. Like I was stupid enough to say that to people who were making my life miserable and who would have instantly gone to our boss with it. One of the three was named Shelly. I don't know if she was the one that made the initial accusation, but she and her two friends all lied to HR and said it happened in front of the three of them. I was fired for supposedly calling our boss that word, and along with a lot of self-righteous anger about it all, I got a better job and moved on. A few years later on Christmas Eve, I was in the post office and someone called my name. I turned to look, and for some reason when I saw her face, I exclaimed, Darlene, like it was someone I was thrilled to see. I don't even know anyone named Darlene, have never known anyone named Darlene, and have no idea why I called her that, but then I said, no, that's not right. She looked like I'd thrown water in her face and said, Shelly. I said, oh right, Shelly. I'm so glad to see you, because I need to thank you and everyone back there. Because all the lies you told, and the nasty things you did to me to get fired, turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. I have a great job now with people I love, and I make a ton more money. And it's all thanks to you and everyone at so and so. She suddenly looked like she'd bitten into a lemon and said, Well, you have a Merry Christmas. And I walked away. 
I could be wrong, but I feel like it seemed like there's a pretty clear double standard going on here. First of all, you reverse the gender roles going on here, and that mean guys crowd nowadays, if that got out properly, might end up getting those people totally blacklisted. If they didn't have enough power or nepotism to cover up the fact that they're being sexually harassing, anyways. Our next story is by Z1000Kawa, saying you're the boss to your boss. So this happened two years ago. Little bit of background, I work for a security company at a European airport not allowed to say which, for about 10 years now. Two years ago, I became a high-ranking supervisor. I'm responsible for about 400 plus agents. Because of that, the law states that I have to follow an additional course of 132 hours plus two exams to get my degree as security manager. Basically, everyone from supervisor to manager needs to have this degree. The location of this course is at the training facility of the company where all the security guards of that company follow their basic training, refresh, specialized trainings, etc. And this is where my story begins. First off, one of the rules state that you should wear your uniform at all times when you do work-related things, like a training or course. One exemption is for the newly hired guards. They get the uniform after the first two months of basic, as well as guards from smaller companies who work for a bigger company and people who do one of the manager courses. The uniform is a black pair of pants with a red slash white shirt for agents, red and black for supervisors, a tie for the men that needs to be worn every time, and completely black shoes. No other colors allowed. Important for later. I was there with one of my fellow supervisors in our civilian clothes and we were in a class with mostly people from other units within the company. It's been four years since we were last at the facility, and things changed over the years, so we kind of felt lost there at first. After a few hours, I spotted a friend of mine, Chris, who recently started the course for aviation security. I helped him apply for the job, etc., and I was talking to him, asking how the course was, and some small talk about the airport. He explained to me where the new facility restaurant is, as we were on lunch break, and then went back to his group. This is where the jerk of the story, let's call him Kenny, walks up to me from that same group. Conversation went like this. Kenny said, hey man. I said, hey, how are you? He said, you seem a bit lost here. I said, yeah, it's all a bit new to me and... Kenny says, where's your uniform? Pointing to his own. Never mind, you're scheduled for the airport, right? Did you do your basic already? I knew where this was going and I couldn't let this opportunity go, so I played along. I said, yes, I haven't received the new uniform yet, which is true, as a supervisor wears a different uniform. I hope it suits me, awkward laugh. Yes, I'm going to the airport after this course. I passed basic a while ago, which is all basically true. Kenny says, well, I'm in training right now to be a supervisor there. I say, oh, you're going to be my supervisor? Nice to meet you. He said, yeah, whatever. Next time we meet, you better be in uniform and wear it correctly. Got it, bud? I said, yes, sir. I walked off to the restaurant and told everything to my colleague. We started laughing our butts off and went with our day. I texted my friend Chris and asked for Kenny's full name and what he was like in class. Chris told me everything, how Kenny was walking around like he knew it all, constantly talked back to his instructors and how he didn't give a freak about the uniform or the company's dress code. Really? Kenny also told the group about our conversation and how scared I looked. He and some others laughed about it, but Chris knew this would backfire. And how right he was. Chris never told Kenny he knew me and who I was, because he knew I'd handle it. Fast forward a few weeks later, I passed my course the week before and just got my new red and black uniform. I was sitting at my desk going through the names of all the guards on duty today when I saw Kenny's name on there. I located his position and went to visit him. He was standing there at the x-ray machine, no tie, black and white shoes, and his shirt wasn't ironed. He didn't see me as he was too busy talking with another guy instead of working. I talked to his team leader, who told me he already gave Kenny a warning today about his uniform, but he wouldn't listen. I said I wanted to see Kenny right now in my office. A few minutes later, Kenny walks in and doesn't recognize me at first until... I say, Kenny, you said I needed to be in uniform next time we met, so here I am. Kenny's eyes widened and realized who I was. He said, oh yeah, I was only kidding, sir. I said, never mind, dude. However, let's talk about you. You're not wearing your tie. Your shirt looks like 
well, crap, and your shoes aren't the right color. Not only that, but you ignored your team leader, who I trained, when he warned you about the uniform, and you were a real pain during your training. You're also slacking off at work. How come? Kenny just stood there looking at the ground and mumbled something of an excuse. I say I should write you up for ignoring your team leader, misbehavior, neglect, and slacking off. That's a three-day suspension right there. But I'm in a good mood and you're obviously new here, so I'll let this one go for now. Okay? Kenny said, thank you, sir. I didn't realize it would be a problem. I'll behave accordingly, sir. Promise. I said, great. And oh, one more thing, Kenny. He says, yes, sir. I say, make sure next time we meet, you wear the uniform correctly. Got it, bud? I appreciate the sheer amount of patience OP displayed here. You could have annihilated a total jerk like Kenny who obviously was lying to your face about their reasoning saying, oh I didn't know, even though I warned you about the exact thing I'm doing and I'm putting in zero effort anyways just in general. OP's like, I'm not really going to punish you but I'm going to make sure you feel like a total jerk, an idiot and give them that last chance to turn it around before cementing themselves as a total jerk. Our next story is by Floyd Henderson, one from my dad during his army days, South Africa, about 1979. One of the camps my dad went to, they had a sergeant there harder than nails. Everyone under his command was the best at what they did and all super fit. Also, no one messed around with sergeant or anyone under his command. Other lower rank soldiers and commanding officers were so poop scared of Sarge, mainly because one day Sarge found out his own nephew was stealing from the other soldiers. Sarge drilled his own nephew non-stop until he passed. Sarge got demoted and worked his way back to sergeant. That's where my dad comes in. There was one private who got made troop leader for a bit, who my dad described as a first class jerkhead in training that also made mess ups in training that seemed to be done on purpose. Every time first class jerkhead in training made a mess up, Sarge made him watch while everyone else did PT. One day, everyone has had enough. First class jerkhead in training had a separate bed near the front of the sleeping quarters, so carefully and as quietly as possible, two cupboards were pushed closer together and first class jerkhead in training had his bed lifted onto the top of the cupboards. Right and early the next morning, Sarge is in there sounding the call. First class jerkhead in training nearly knocked himself out he hit the floor so hard. Sarge sees it as his duty to start giving first class jerkhead in training a serious dressing down right there because 1. Why is he playing games sleeping on top of the cupboards? Or 2. Why wasn't he aware enough that someone had put him on top of the cupboards? That's when Sarge chose someone else for the new leader and no more problems. I mean it's nice to finally get this guy out of the way so it isn't like giving any more heartache to people or headaches at least, but I find it so bizarre that OP kind of nonchalantly glanced over the part where they said, Sarge basically ripped into their own nephew non-stop until they passed, and then they only got demoted for it? I don't know if that's like a figure of speech or if that's just like a really bad rumor, but sounds like a bit much. Our next story is by Spotson, ruin my graduation and work me like a rented mule? Well. Hope you don't like salt in your food. This all happened in 1999. Backstory, my cousin Charlotte and I are about the same age. We come from a pretty big family, Thanksgiving could be upwards of 35 people, and she was completely self-obsessed. She was dating a man who was 15 years older than her. She was about to break up with him because she wasn't sure she'd still find him attractive in 10 years. She was 25, he 40. But then he reveals he has over a million dollars because his parents left him a large sum of money when they died. All of a sudden, she's pretty sure he'll look just fine in 10 years. So she sets about getting married. My mother has only one request. Don't get married on the last Saturday of May, as that was when I was going to my graduation from college. Well, wouldn't you know it, that's just the day she picked. Her side of the family downplays it. After all, what's a graduation when compared to a wedding? I grip my teeth and agree to not make a big stink and we all drive six hours to her wedding. The story, we get a call the night before to get to their house, it was held at their home, early so we can set up. And we should bring our appetites because he's going to serve us breakfast. Okay, fair play. So we pull up the morning of the wedding, it's family so you pitch in. We walk in and are immediately put to work. We set up the table in the front yard and chairs in the back, over 150 chairs to be exact. 
We work for over an hour all the time getting hungrier and hungrier. At around 10 or so, we ask our uncle where the food is. Well, didn't we get any when we came in? No, we got there and we were put right to work. Oh well, no time now. Then the caterers show up. Well, it's a guy that goes to my uncle's church and he brought two 15-year-old waifs. The food is all pre-packaged and there's a ton of it. So my sister gets put to work in the kitchen warming it up while my brother and I are put to work setting up the serving lines. Now, my uncle was one of the cheapest men on the planet and it was dawning on us that this was a Diamond Jim special. That's what we called it when he cheaped out on everything and expected everyone else to pick up the slack. By now, my brother and I have sweated through our undershirts and we're looking pretty ragged. All the while, my cousin's drifting around the house like she's royalty. I swear to God, if she had just told me, thank you for doing this, I know you missed your graduation for my big day, and I appreciate it, nothing that happened next would have. But instead, she walked up to me and said, you're going to fix your hair before the service, right? I gritted my teeth and went back to putting tablecloths out. The wedding comes and goes? The service was fine, but 30 minutes late because her royal highness wanted to make an entrance. My sister didn't get to see the first half because she was still warming up thousands of meatballs for the serving trays. Then the service is over, and without missing a beat, my uncle looks at my brother and I and says, Okay, now move all the chairs out front to the tables. My brother looks at him like he's about to murder him, but we do it anyway. All the while, we're taking crap from the guests like, Um, we need chairs over here, and you two really should have done this earlier. But the straw that broke the camel's back was when, at a moment's notice, Charlotte decides that because some of her favorite flowers were in bloom, that she wanted to rearrange the entire wedding meal so she could take her pictures there. And oh, won't it just be fun for everyone to watch them being taken? My brother and I are summoned, and off to work we go. While this is going on, the caterer and my uncle are just sitting under a tree having a big old time, while my sister runs the kitchen and is busting her butt to help these two overworked freshmen. Those two girls look like they were going to die. We are beyond hungry. Remember, we didn't get to eat that morning. But by the time we finally finished, most of the food was gone. My siblings and I go back into their house and scrounge whatever's left and sit in the living room. We're all exhausted and looking for payback. The revenge, like I said before, all of this could have just been avoided with just a little recognition for our efforts, but we came up with what we called our severance package. Just a little couple perks for our work. Charlotte's sister, Bess, hates weddings and isn't a huge fan of her sister's, so we ask her what airline they're taking to go to Hawaii on their honeymoon. She tells us, and I get on the phone as the groom. This is pre-2001, so it was a much different airline industry I was dealing with. My initial plan was to upgrade their tickets to first class. The dude could afford it, and we'd suspected he'd think Charlotte did it. Well, turns out they were all booked. So, quick-witted little weasel that I was, I tell the woman on the line that I was supposed to get the tickets upgraded for our honeymoon, and that my new wife was going to be pissed. So could she please move up to the opposite ends of the plane so she won't badger me all the way there? The woman gets suspicious and asks if this is a prank. I assure her it's not, and she moves the seats. I then ask for the no sodium meal because we didn't get to eat today. She gets to have a garbage meal on her flight. As the happy couple drove off to their night at a B&B, we waved our goodbyes and headed to a local casino to blow off some steam. The aftermath? We knew crap was going to hit the fan because Charlotte simply sees all inconvenience in her life as the worst thing imaginable. But what we didn't know is that Bess decided she wanted to in and started really scorching some earth. She called up and cancelled their B&B as well as did something to the luggage that no one would explain. Then when confronted, pinned it all on us. They had to come back and stay the night with their parents before leaving the next day. We found out this part of the story at 4 in the morning when we returned to our hotel to find my mother waiting outside for us. Now to be clear, my mother is an amazing woman. A woman full to the brim of the cream of human kindness. But that wasn't the face she was wearing when we pulled up. No, she was wearing the face she wore that time she helped the FBI nail a con man who was trying to destroy our family business to the wall. A story for another day. This turned into a sore spot from which our extended family never really recovered. I feel bad about that, but in the spirit of giving her an opportunity to even the score, 
I invited her to my wedding. She declined. I've only seen her at family funerals. I don't know if it's rude of me to say, but like, considering all the selfish behavior and lack of recognition and lack of care expressed by their relatives, it might not be the worst thing that this led to a no contact situation like, Opie didn't have to deal with them anymore. Over the years, maybe it saved them some extra grief. This next story is by Five Frog Margin, entitled Baby Brother Feels the Need to Create Drama Over a Thanksgiving Drive to Aunt Patty's. I give him enough rope to hoist himself. I have an obnoxious younger brother, the baby of the family. He was always the good kid compared to me, so my mother indulged him all of his life, which resulted in a spoiled little boy who thinks the world exists to serve him. He had deep daddy issues, even now into his 40s. As his older brother, I'm a bit of a stand-in for our father. I look just like dad, and the family often jokes that I'm dad's name part two. Despite my checkered past, I straightened out and grew into a hipper version of dad with many of the same interests. This drives little brother Nicky up the freaking wall, and he's transferred all of his daddy issues onto me. Even into his 30s, he was always trying to berate me and criticize everything I did. Case in point, and here's where the story starts, 10 years ago, I offered to drive my mother to the family Thanksgiving about 90 minutes away. I picked up my daughter and stopped by mom's to get her. Of course, little brother Nicky was there. I'd already banned him from my car due to his obnoxiousness and endless complaining, so he decided his revenge. Instead, he was going to follow us to Aunt Patty's house for Thanksgiving. Never mind, he'd been there countless times and knew the way. I am a journey, not the destination kind of dude. I like to enjoy the experience. Even if it's a drive I've done a hundred times, the drive was nice. Daughter in the back seat, mom in front. We took it easy, checking out the sights along the way, going the speed limit. We even stopped a few times to talk about this lake or that scenic view, and even swung through old historic neighborhoods to see the houses. Nikki stayed right on my bumper, flashing his lights when I stopped too long. At Thanksgiving, he loudly insulted me to everyone for driving like an old lady. When I told him I'd be going home the same way in speed, he snapped that he didn't have time to follow my slow butt and left. The petty revenge, the following year I told him, after last year, I didn't want him following me, period. We'd meet him there. Telling him no is like waving a red flag to a bull. It sets him off. And he was at my mother's 30 minutes early just to make sure I knew he'd be following me like it or not. He had a new BMW coupe that he intended to show off as well. All I have is my six-year-old forerunner. When I showed up, he immediately snapped, He was following me, deal with it. As we all took off, I headed west instead of east. I played around a bit trying to lose him, but he was on my butt showing off in the new BMW. I then headed for a new road being built in town. We used to bike the trail as kids, and we knew it connected close to a state highway. Heck, mom used it as a shortcut to football practice. It was still dirt with mounds of sand and gravel throughout. He tried to follow, but I hit all of the potholes, did some off-roading, and made a cloudy mess. He tried to call, but I sent him straight to voicemail. He decided to outsmart me and turned around. He raced to the destination where the new road ended, expecting to cut me off and begin following me again. Of course, once he was gone, we turned around, got back on the main road, and took a third circuitous route to Aunt Patty's. Had another nice, slow, scenic drive, with mom telling daughter all about the used-to-be's. Aunt Patty called us, prompted by a concerned Nikki, of course, and we told her we were fine and would be there around one, just in time for turkey. Nikki sulked the entire meal. When it came time to leave, I said we'd be staying another couple of hours. Mom didn't complain, even suggested spending the night. Nikki complained about the traffic, the driving at night, and the getting mom home so late. I told him he was welcome to leave anytime. We'd be just fine. By now, the family had caught on to his manufactured drama and condescendingly asked him if he needed a guide to get back to the place you've lived all your life. He left in a huff. Can I just say I love the composure and tactics OP expressed here? Don't let the guy rile you up. Don't let the guy get you uneven and unkeeled. 
you just keep making the smart decisions, not giving them anything to use against you, and over a long stretch of time you just keep knocking them one stair down the next all the way down to the bottom of the entire staircase. Need somebody to hold your hand on the way out, Nikki? Our next story is by a serious question. Some drunk jerks wanted to keep me awake, so I made them suffer by freezing their hair like I'm the Iceman. I used to live across from one bar and next to another. I was in my late 20s. And there was one dark and freezing winter night in which two rowdy young lovers left one of these bars and then decided to loiter underneath my bedroom window in the alley for a very long period of time. And of course, they were drunk, loud, and obnoxious. I was sleeping when they woke me up. It was around 3 a.m. The bar had been closed for nearly an hour. I opened the window and asked them to please be quiet and leave. They said okay quite dismissively, and I assumed they would really go because it was below zero, so it was too cold for them to be there very long anyway. I waited a little while, but after a while they still hadn't left, so I opened the window and asked them to leave again. They basically told me to freak off. At that point, I got hostile and told them I'd ask nicely and wasn't going to ask nicely again. They just laughed at me. This continued on for a while, and every time I looked out, They were leaning against the wall laughing, drunkenly and kissing and smoking. It's well after 3. I open the window and tell them I am done with the warnings. So they laugh at me some more. At this point, they think keeping me up all night is freaking hilarious. I then decide that I would like to make them colder because I wanted to find out how cold they had to be to leave. So I went into my kitchen and got a very large soup pot and ran the cold water in the sink until it was as icy as possible and I filled the soup pot up to the brim. I lugged it to my bedroom window and slid the window up. The screen was already removed. They looked up and saw me smiling down at them, and they blearily waved me off and went back to focusing on each other. At that point, they weren't concerned with me and felt that they had really owned me, so they weren't paying any attention when I tilted this soup pot over the window ledge and poured this ice-cold water down onto their heads. They were not wearing hats. As the water poured down onto their heads, they screamed and ran. As they ran, I heard one of them screaming, My hair is freezing! Which I know for a fact, it only takes seconds to freeze your hair when it's wet and cold weather. I felt pretty pleased with my inventiveness and proudly laughed myself to sleep. They never loitered under my bedroom window again. They thought they could inconvenience me and laugh at me, but I got the last laugh. I wonder, OP probably could have been liable for some kind of like charge, right? Obviously, they were causing a disturbance, but dumping water on their heads while it's freezing outside, that's probably like some kind of assault, right? I mean, they're just a couple drunks anyways, but I'm just kind of curious. And our final story of the day is by Top Desert Ace. Thank you, you slash Dunachius, for reminding me of this fun story of revenge. Info leading up to the revenge. So, back a while, at my other job at an animal shelter, myself and a couple co-workers were talking, and one co-worker mentioned that her son's car kept getting messed up in the student parking lot at the high school. So I asked why, and she said that apparently another student has it in his head that one particular spot in the student parking lot is his, despite there never having been assigned parking at that school. Now, this kid, who I'll call a little crap, has a tow truck. Not even one of those big flatbed trucks, it's a crappy little beater pickup with a tow hook in the back. If you've seen the movie Cars, think slightly bigger than Mater. Anyways, whenever someone parks in Little Crap's spot, he then tows that person's car out and parks in the aforementioned spot, usually damaging the vehicle in the process. Well, while my coworker was telling us this, I said, you know what would be funny? Parking the Bearcat in that spot and weighing it down. It would be freaking hilarious to see that little crap try and tow that big chungus of a vehicle. The chief of police was chatting with us. The animal shelter in my hometown is considered part of the police department, and officers will occasionally visit us every once in a while. And he laughed and said, I would love to see that. The revenge. So, to start, the state I live in, according to the laws, Moving a vehicle a certain distance without the owner's consent and without proper towing permits is considered vehicle theft. I was told the story a few days later, so here's how it went down. The police chief placed a bait truck in the parking spot and set up a couple undercover units close by, and the truck itself was weighed down with a crap load of cement bags. My coworker said she was surprised the truck didn't collapse under the weight. Sure as crap, little crap shows up, sees the truck in his spot, and attempts to tow it away. 
Now, the plan was for the undercovers to come out and arrest him right then and there. What happened was that little crap did a burnout trying to move the truck. He was successful for a few feet, at least the bare minimum for a misdemeanor, and then the back axle popped out of the tow truck. The undercovers come out and arrested little crap. The camera footage was obtained, which showed the roughly hundred other times he's done this, which of course only bumped up his charges. Literally no remorse even remotely possible for somebody that's going to go and act like that. Trying to have ownership over a at least semi-public parking lot, no assigned parking, and willingly damaging other people's vehicles and somehow getting away with it? This kid deserved every sentencing that they got. Flame War Years ago, when AOL was still a big thing, Facebook and Twitter weren't even thought of yet. There were discussion alt and SOT type news groups which were the popular way of sharing information on any specific topic. There was an individual who would always be around the men's rights or divorce slash child custody forums and had actually started a business as a consultant for men who found themselves in trouble. The thing was, he was a loudmouth who would verbally attack and insult anyone who disagreed with him, mostly women. He'd try to intimidate, often by looking up any information he could find on the person and then stalking them offline, posting home addresses, workplace information, names of family members. Most who argued with him would either be scared away or would tire of him repeating the same rants over and over and would kill file him and move on. I was someone who was posting to the men's group as well about my own experiences with child custody matters. I thought it would be helpful to take the modest information I'd learned and formulate it into a website where others could benefit from it. This was around the time when GeoCities was a service that actually allowed one to create web pages well before the age of WordPress or Wix. This particular guy took exception to me and my web pages, probably because I was providing info for free, which he wanted to charge thousands of dollars for. He began attacking me and following me all over the internet, scouring for any information he could find about me. I probably would have tired of him rather quickly, like so many of his other targets, but along the way, he learned that I'd served in the Marine Corps. He took this and began spreading lies that I'd been dishonorably discharged, fled from the enemy in combat, committed adultery with the wives of the men I'd served with, etc. I took these lies very personally. I served two enlistments, including combat service, and was honorably discharged. So, instead of continuing to create web pages about men's issues, I changed my tech and instead created a page about this individual. First, I chronicled his attacks against me, culminating with his false smears about my military service. He'd made several statements about the type and reason of discharge I'd received, each of which contradicted the others. You can't get a medical discharge for mental issues and a dishonorable discharge for conduct unbecoming. So I reproduced each of his posted statements. I also collected instances where he'd harassed others, degraded women, threatened to have one assaulted, and reproduced all of this with the full post headers. One of his tactics was to complain to his detractor's internet provider, sending several emails a day, threatening them with legal action until they would grow tired of it and close the person's account. He got this webpage of mine suspended because it was on a free provider who didn't have the resources to deal with his constant complaining. So I purchased my very own .com domain, a pretty big deal at that time, and the domain was about followed by his name. Then I found an inexpensive web hosting service in Australia which would ignore his frantic complaints and uploaded my pages there, all the while expanding them as he continued to harass. Because the domain and the content of the pages contained his name, the internet search engines indexed it, and people like his professional colleagues and prospective clientele would easily find the site and read about how he was carrying on. I expanded the site with more documentation. He claimed to be a financial wizard, but I found the public record of a bankruptcy filing he'd done and posted the PDF to my site. He claimed to possess a degree in child psychology, but when I found his CV, it turned out his education had come from a well-known diploma mill, meaning he paid a fee to an unaccredited university and they sent a degree in the mail. Yep, I posted that on the site too. All the while, he's threatening to sue me, telling me all about the massive law enforcement investigation which is about to arrest and charge me, 
but all the information on the slide was true, and most of it was reproduced from his own words as posted in various places on the internet. He would also belittle everyone in the divorce groups about what horrible spouses and parents we must be, often posting outright lies that we'd been charged with child abuse, spousal abuse, committing adultery, etc., all the while claiming what a great family person he was. It came to light that his own daughter hated his guts, probably because he ignored her for years while he hammered away as a keyboard warrior. It came to our attention that his daughter had actually done adult entertainment. In somewhat of a jerk move, I emailed him privately, mentioning the stage name she'd used, which was at that point not public knowledge, and some taunting remark that it would be terrible if this got out. Nevertheless, I refrained from exposing it, feeling that it would hurt the daughter who had done nothing to anyone. No matter, the guy himself took my entire email and publicly posted it on the internet, revealing her information himself. This went on for years, and over time, many colleagues and trade organizations began severing ties with him. The bankruptcy itself was probably, at least in part, the result of his business suffering because of his conduct online, and my site calling attention to it. According to his filing, he had gone from a six-figure income to near-minimum wage over the course of a couple of years. The entire time, there was a notice on the bottom of my webpage as well, making reference to his original false statements about my military service. If he could provide proof to back up his claims about my discharge, I would agree to immediately remove the pages. The other part of this was, he could simply admit that he lied and make a public apology after which I'd also remove the pages and leave the net. Rather than do this, he allowed his business to be run into the ground. Some years ago, he died alone and penniless. Does this story also resonate with you guys nowadays more than ever? It just seems like every day you're dealing with a constant heavy bombardment of people making frivolous claims and trying to pass it as the truth. Social media as a whole nowadays is just so rampant with people that, regardless of what is the actual truth, will push their narrative and take it as the truth as, as far as they can take it. Do you guys sometimes wish that social media didn't exist? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And while you're at it, make sure to like and subscribe so you never miss my daily videos with awesome stories like this next one from Talon Card 815 got revenge on an April Fool's Joker with a petty joke. First off, I know many will say this is just a joke that circulates. Yes it is, I managed to successfully pull it off with the help of a few people. My friend likes to pull the simple April Fool's jokes. He does it constantly. This year, he happened to be going to Disney World from March 27th to April 2nd. He's also a fan of The Lion King. Yep, that's where we're going. He's also not the sharpest tool in the shed, hence the reason this worked. I told his wife what I had planned, and she was on board completely. I tell him that he's lucky he'll be there on the first of the month. Careful not to say April, because they have a Lion King special on the first, which is King's Day. When he goes to eat dinner, he has to remember to ask for it. March 31st comes, I text him that night to remember to order the Lion King special tomorrow. He texts back that his wife already reminded him. April 1st, they go to dinner and he asks for the Lion King special. The waiter says, excuse me, sir? He says, yeah, the hot tuna piccata sandwich. It's only offered on the first of the month. The waiter goes, the hot tuna piccata that's offered on the first of the month. They say, yes, that one. The waiter says, so you want a hot tuna piccata, the Lion King special, on April Fool's Day? At this point, his wife loses it and busts out laughing. Again, him not being the sharpest tool in the shed goes, what's so funny? The waiter breaks into song, hot tuna piccata, what a wonderful phrase. The wife told me she had tears streaming down her face as he realizes it and says, that son of a witch, he got me. My only regret is I wasn't able to see it in person. John, if you by some chance are reading this, gotcha. Ain't no passing craze. Not gonna lie, this is actually the first time I've ever heard of the hot tuna piccata prank, but it's pretty darn good. Our next story is by Dublin Cheesy. Roommate left a mess, so I dumped his prized herb garden. In college, lease was up on an apartment I shared with another student. I had a vacation the second week before move out and he was going on vacation and moving out before I got back from vacation. So we planned and agreed to what each of us were responsible for before I left on my vacation. 
However, when I got home and he was already gone, I saw he had used my dishes to cook and eat, but he didn't even wash them. He cleaned his part of the apartment and took his own dishes, but he left a gross mess of rotting food on my dishes. No note, apology, or anything. Just a little screw you on the way out the door. The incredible thing was he didn't even finish moving his own stuff, but we had to be out before he would return from his vacation. It was pretty incredible because he left the two of the things most valuable to him. One was an heirloom painting from his grandma, and the other was a collection of herbs he'd been growing for years. Looking at all the containers that comprised his garden, I realized I had a few choices. Here are those choices in order of least work for me to most work. 1. Take them to the next door neighbor who we were friends with for that friend to keep for a week. 2. Make multiple trips down the hall, down the stairs, past the parking area, past the next building, and then toss them one by one into the commercial garbage bin. 3. Make a special moving trip or two just for those herbs to carefully transport them to my new place and then unload them and care for them for another week until he got back. Number 3 was out of the question. Number two was a lot more work over number one, but this is the petty revenge sub after all. When he returned and heard from mutual friends that I dumped his prized garden, he apparently got quite upset. Oops. Our friends set a date and time to meet at my place, and they came with him because they were afraid it would turn into a fight. Double oops. I didn't give a care. Wasn't afraid of him to begin with, and I still had his grandma's painting. Anyway, he comes over and starts yelling at me about how much his herb garden was worth, blah blah blah. I said that's his problem. He should have cleaned my dishes after using them and should not have left food out in the summer when he knew that I would not return for a few days. He was a little embarrassed when our friends looked at him like, what a jerk move. Still mad, but now more whining than yelling, I told him to wait a moment. I went to the back room and brought out his grandma's painting. Everyone knew about that painting. So they were shocked that 1. He pulled that jerk move, 2. He left his whole garden, and 3. Left that painting. Giving him the painting, I told him he's lucky I saved that painting, and the loss of the herbs was a good lesson for him. He was ticked off again. Triple oops. We went to the same college in a small town, so although I never hung out with him again, I heard about him from his friends every now and then. For the next two years, I heard every once in a while that he was still pissed off because it cost him hundreds of dollars and many months to replace that garden. For as much as this guy was pissed off, they sure did handle things with such a lack of care. Imagine having anything you spent hundreds of dollars on and hours setting up and then you just leave it behind when you move? You basically abandon it at that point. You shouldn't be mad that OP did anything with it, especially for how much of a jerk you were being. Our next story is by TB Fitz, good luck on your own. So this happened a few years back, so forgive me for being fuzzy with details. This all started around June. Also mandatory English, not first language warning. I used to work as a salesperson. The job, coworkers, and customers were generally great. So great, they had me tolerate the awful owner. He was your general terrible boss, treating employees as lesser people, coming in late if at all refusing requests for time off at the last moment, etc. Then came the worst stunt he pulled. Fridays, we used to stay open until 9pm instead of the regular 6pm. One Friday, he came up to me and said, OP, I've decided that it's not fair you never work this late shift, so you will also have to. You can choose when you start doing so, tonight or next week. I tried arguing I had prior engagements, but he wouldn't have it. That's when I started plotting. I knew one of my coworkers was studying in a completely different field and she was nearing her finals. Another coworker had expressed she wanted to go back to school starting September. I contacted HR using a different phone number than the one on file, gave them a random name, just so I could confirm my one month's notice could legally be sent by email. Before his four week vacation, just as expected, both my coworkers gave their notice. I had been on several interviews by then and landed a new job. Once he was away for a week, I sent him my own notice via email. His connection on his vacation address was sketchy at best, so it took him two more weeks to find out his last remaining employee was leaving as well. Safe to say, both his vacation and his business were ruined, and I got lower stress and a better paying job in return. This just continues to reinforce the theme of People don't quit bad jobs, they quit bad managers. 
It's one thing if the job is so-so, as long as it pays. But if somebody above you is going to be absolutely horrid to work with, you're just not going to stick around and you're not going to deal with that. Our next story is from Alia Stark. Dave Matthews Band. After a decade of front house work, I'm now a dishwasher at a popular outdoor restaurant. When I started, we had a true unicorn of a head chef. Super chill, very talented, a big fan of customers who would come specifically to see and order food from her. Unfortunately, nothing gold can stay so. After months of back-to-back doubles, she left us to take another job that valued her time more. Her replacement is a grumpy old misogynist who freaking loves Dave Matthews Band as much as he hates working with women who don't defer to him without question. But don't call him chef. He doesn't go in for that BS. The guy complains constantly, but like, to himself. And if you acknowledge it, he will straight up ignore you. Yesterday I wasn't feeling well. I'm in the middle of a truly gnarly period, and my boyfriend's sick, and I probably got two hours of sleep. I and literally everyone else who works in the kitchen aside from grumpy not chef am too short to hang up the pans, so I put them on the table next to where they hang. This prompted him to say, we may as well not even have a dishwasher. I responded saying, is there a problem? Silence. I am literally too short to hang these up, and last time I tried, I got elbowed in the boob, so I'm not trying to have that happen again. Silence. Okay, buddy, whatever. Then he told our 21-year-old server, in nursing school, she frequently brings study material for slow times in the kitchen that men like women who study but not too much. Charming. Today it's been three months straight of Dave Matthews Band all day, every day. I once tried to put my music on, Leanne La Hava's very chill singer-songwriter, nothing annoying or offensive, and he screamed about how it was too loud and turned off the speakers. I had not adjusted the volume. No one else had tried to play their own stuff since, and neither did I. Instead, after the third version of Trippin' Billy's, I waited until he walked far enough away that his Bluetooth disconnected from the speaker. I quickly connected mine, but didn't put anything on. He came back in and spent about 10 minutes frantically but silently trying to figure out how to get his synced back up. He turned off the speakers to reset them, and I quickly connected my phone again. Three times. After about half an hour, I had to go to the bathroom, and when I came back he had it set back up. None the wiser, but definitely the more annoyed. I can't tell anyone right now because he's still here but I'm so pleased to have this petty weapon in my arsenal, and I plan on employing it every time he goes for a smoke. It's a boy's, woman's, dream. If this is like a proper Bluetooth speaker, I just hope that nobody gives OP a call. I guess they can have vibration on where only their media is playing? Just imagine how awkward it would be if OP slipped up and their ringtone started playing. Worth it though, honestly, just to piss this guy off. This next story is by Annie Jack. Easter decorations. This happened a few years ago. A few neighbors had Easter decorations out. Bunnies, oversized plastic eggs, etc. One neighbor had a three to four foot wooden cross with a purple stole draped over it. It was quite nice looking and very tasteful in my opinion. The neighbor with the cross received a letter from the homeowners association saying her decoration was violating HOA rules. She contacted the HOA to ask which rule she was violating. They said no holiday decorations allowed other than in December. She then checked with the other neighbors with decorations, and none of them had received a letter. She contacted the HOA again and asked for the specific clause stating no holiday decorations. Turns out no such clause existed. The HOA president didn't mind the more secular decorations, bunnies, chicks, eggs, etc., but didn't like the cross. The petty revenge? Next year, she had a six-foot blow-up cross. You know, you want to talk politics? Sure, you should probably be able to separate your religion in a platform like that. But come on, you're talking about somebody's own home, regardless of an HOA. In fact, I think if you try to control somebody from dolling their house up for a religious holiday they celebrate, you're probably a terrible person. Imagine basically trying to tell somebody, No, you can't decorate your own home for a religious holiday that you celebrate. Our next story is by IPSOS Custodies 420. Accuse me of smoking pot in your bathroom? Okay. So here's another one of my, 33-year-old female, stories about living with Chad, 36-year-old male. 
So one day, I was watching TV in the living room, messaging friends back and forth. I had just used the washroom. In an unladylike fashion, took a rank woodland-sized dump in the bathroom. I became nose-blind to it. About 10 minutes later, Chad gets home and walks into the bathroom and comes out into the living room and says, What does my bathroom smell like? So, being a smart bud, I said, I don't know, what? He repeated the question again, more sternly, and I just looked at him and told him I'd used it to poop right before he got home. He repeated the question again. Now, it's legal in my area, and I was a teen once, so I put two and two together and said, Oh, come on now, I wasn't doing drugs in your bathroom. He told me that he didn't mind the use of, but not in his house. I told him that's fine, because I hadn't had any since I moved in months before, and I like smoking it outside, even in freezing cold weather. He proceeded to tear apart all my stuff in the bathroom, and then started ripping my room apart, trying to smell the stash, until I showed him the bank statement of the last time I bought any, long before I moved in. He sulked in the bathroom, texting me that it smelled bad, he doesn't do anything substances, so I don't think he knows what it smells like. So I picked up some essential oils of his favorite smells, and I started to make increasingly enticing smell diffusers that I would leave randomly around the house. It would arouse him enough to think that I was making his favorite foods or ask what the amazing smell was, and I would reply with, what smell? Drove him nuts. Just imagine how embarrassing it would be to be like in the same social circle after you break up and being able to repeat that story over and over again of how they thought you taking a dump in the bathroom and how they tore the part of place looking for the substances when the entire time it was just you having went to the bathroom. Our next story is by Broken Softly, Thump, Thump, Thump. I live in an apartment below a herd of elephants. When we had an earthquake, I woke up legitimately thinking that the neighbors were just jumping up and down at 5 in the morning. I could go on and on, but that's the gist. I bought a cat toy that attaches to the door frame with a toy on a bungee cord. My kitties absolutely love it. An unexpected side effect is that a cat will catch the toy, try to walk away with their prize, and then the toy gets caught by the bungee. The toy goes thump against the ceiling and the cats try again. Within half an hour, they can catch it a good 5-7 to seven times. I usually put it up between 5 and 8 p.m. when I get home so I can supervise them playing. The neighbors have been much quieter lately. That's really a good way to describe it, living in an apartment below a herd of elephants. I've never had to deal with living in an apartment, but reading all these stories and knowing how based in truth they are, I feel bad for the people that do have to just somehow make do with people stomping around all the time. Like if I put myself there, how could I even like go and have the time to read all these stories if people around upstairs were like giving a good old every so often. Our next story is by Potatoes Lad. Cut me off in the drive through I think not. I want to tell the story of the time that someone tried to cut me off in the two-lane drive-thru at McDonald's. It was two lanes that merged into one at the windows. I wasn't necessarily in a hurry, but I finished my order first and started to pull out and they tried to cut in front of me. I drive a crap box Ford freaking Ranger so I just kept going and went around them. They were obviously upset so I paid for their food at the first window. At the second window, I picked up their food and went to work. I like to consider myself an expert of neutral chaos and laugh about that moment to this day. Now I'm just wondering, did they get stuck with OP's order? Or did OP pay for both their order and the other person's order, take both of them and then drive off? Either way, very chaotic for sure. Our next story is by Hop on Bop. You earned this Christmas gift. Today, parked at Wally World finishing my coffee, mom and three kids park across from me, Flops the smallest in a cart from the corral, pushes it 15 feet, cusses bad wheel, yanks the kid out, gets another cart, leaving the first one behind a car. She gets on her phone and they head in, with her fussing they need to hurry up. I follow a bit later, grabbing the cart before she left. Of course, she becomes that one that you keep running into over and over, loud on the phone, ignoring or shouting, come on, at the surprisingly well-behaved kids and blocking the aisles. I know she gave at least two employees grief because she didn't have time to mess around. I get done and I'm heading out just in time to hear her say, no I don't have any quarters, to the two kids sitting on the ride on horse and race car in the vestibule. Well guess who has a handful of shiny quarters he was holding for another coffee? This guy. 
Hey, darling, I gotcha. Merry Christmas. You share with your brothers. Gave mom a wink and a Merry Christmas. She gave me a half-butt smile that didn't reach her narrowed eyes. As the horse started trotting, I made my exit. I just hope that over time, this mom's behavior doesn't rub off on those kids. Honestly, bless those really well-behaved kids, especially when their mom is, let's just say, like that. Our next story is by Lay10021. Trick me into Walmart Plus? I'll use your crappy service one can at a time. I'm trying to get my husband a PS5 for Christmas. I'm not as savvy as many other people out there when it comes to technology, so I'm not having much luck. I tried to get one from Walmart, but the notification said the releases are for Walmart Plus only. I now realize this is a ploy to get people to join, but I figured I would have some luck at least. Wanting to be a good wife, I joined and have now wasted about 12 hours of my life waiting in virtual lines that just eventually disappear, and I'm out $98. Now I know Walmart doesn't really care about my petty revenge, so this is really more for my peace of mind. The only benefit I see from Walmart Plus is that they offer free shipping on any order instead of $5.99 for orders under $35. So I've been using this to my benefit. When I'm at the store and I see an item I think I can get cheaper at Walmart, I look on my app and if it's cheaper, I order it. I'm talking a can of beans, but I do it one at a time. So they have to ship a can of beans to me for free. And then the next day, maybe it's a jar of spices. That way I'm going to save the $98 through comparison shopping for the next year. And then they have to ship me those items for free. Again, I know they don't give a flying fig, but it gives me a little satisfaction. Does anyone know of any other ways I can use Walmart Plus and stick it to them? I think maybe a good way you could continue to use this is if you can add multiple addresses. You could probably have somebody cash app you some money and just use your Walmart Plus to ship them some cheapo items too. Just make it convenient for your whole family. Our next story is by Kaya Lily. My great grandmother learned how to repair her car after her husband tried to force her to stay home. So a little bit of backstory. My great grandma was born in the late 1920s. So when she got pregnant outside of wedlock, her family forced her to marry my great grandfather, which really sucked for her because she really didn't like him. She and my great grandpa pretty much never got along. They were always fighting and would constantly do petty things to each other, like my great-grandma putting a raw piece of meat on two slices of bread when my great-grandpa refused to eat what she made and demanded she make him a sandwich. But my great-grandpa could also be really controlling. My great-grandpa refused to let my great-grandma leave the house to do her own errands or have any form of life. If she wasn't leaving to go to work or doing stuff specifically for or with him, she wasn't allowed to leave. To ensure this, he would take essential parts out of her car when he left for work. He'd take the parts with him and always assumed he had her beat. Well, my great grandma was a feisty woman who wasn't about to put up with that. So she got a book on basic mechanics to learn how to put her engine back together. She then would go buy parts to her car that my great grandpa would regularly take out. He wasn't a mechanic or anything, so it was always small parts that would be easy to take out and put back in if he knew what you were doing. After he would leave for work, she'd wait a bit to make sure he wasn't coming back for anything, and then she would get the parts. To make sure my great grandpa didn't know what she was doing, she hid all of the parts in things like flower pots and containers of bird seed that he never messed with. She'd put the part in her car, go into town to do whatever, and then would take the part back out and rehide it before my great grandpa got home. As far as I know, he never figured out what she was doing. He just smugly believed that he had her completely stranded at home. All the while, she was out on the town living her own life. One final petty thing she did after he passed was to place a whole bunch of plants in his room. They had separate bedrooms since it was custom and they hated each other. She had all kinds of plants in there that he had hated and would never let her keep. She loved those plants and took great care of them until she couldn't anymore. We've tried to put some of those flowers on her grave now that she's passed. If I remember correctly, she's not placed near my grandfather. Love how petty my great grandma could be. Man, can you just imagine being back in the 1920s and having a culture where if you're having a baby out of wedlock, 
You're just kind of expected to settle down with that guy, marry them right then and there, and you're just going to have to make it work. And in that culture, a lot of times you were expected to be the subservient housewife. Can you imagine having a ball and chain to some guy that doesn't even treat you well like that? Wants to essentially make sure you can't leave the house reasonably? Honestly, to me, it sounds like a nightmare, and a hundred years later, I think it's pretty great how much we've progressed beyond that kind of culture. But that's not to say you don't hear your fair share of people that say they miss that kind of culture. My dad was let off from his job and transportation because of his crappy boss and me and my siblings destroyed the five-star reviews they had. A little bit of info I think might be useful before getting into the story, and not gonna lie, this is the first time I read a post in any of the subreddits here, so I might come off as awkward. My family and I are not native to the country we live in. I came to the country as an immigrant along with my parents, but my siblings were born here. My dad's been working in the transportation company for 10 years now, which means all of my teenage years and a few years into my early 20s, he's been slaving away for them, coming home after 10 to 12, sometimes even 13 hour shifts, barely giving me time to spend with him and my siblings. My dad got the worst routes for his job, and every other week of the month, aka two out of the four weeks, he takes a route that's supposed to be taken by three people at the very least. But nope, it all fell on his shoulders. Lastly, I'd like to mention that my dad was about 35 when he started to work with them, so the math is easy to add up. Now onto the pettiness. My dad recently bought a new car, and the one we bought it from apparently failed to mention a few defects in the description. And of course, we had to send it to a workshop to check what was wrong with it. Come a few days later, they said X and Y was wrong and needed to be bought and could be fixed at home. So we did. Then something else came out and we sent it there again. This time it had two long lines scratched to the back of the car to the point of stupidity at how they didn't notice it and thus failed to inform us. Fine, we went to talk to them and nothing came of it as far as I can remember. A few days after, my dad and my younger brother, also in his 20s, went today to talk to them about the incident having them either pay us back what we spent or we'd raise a complaint because of the poor service they provided us. To certain degrees this is possible, which was the case here. My dad was wearing his work attire as he only has a few hours before his work starts at 10am. The employer at the workshop, after some time, became hostile towards my dad and came up to his face pushing him and even hitting him on the head when my dad did nothing other than rightfully expressing his annoyance at the poor service. After my dad came back home from work, he told us his boss, now ex-boss, had let him off of work. At first I didn't believe it, and then it clicked that he wasn't choking. Apparently it was, to quote my father, it was because the employer got physical with me while I was wearing the work attire with its logo, and instead I could have gone there after work. First off, how was it my dad's fault for someone else being physical with them? Secondly, BS, how the freak can my dad go there after work hours when he works 10 to 12 hour shifts because you refuse to split his routes on three people as you're freaking supposed to do? So my younger brothers and I thought, you want to be petty and a complete crap bag? Fine, we'll give you pettiness. The first of my younger brothers went to the local newspaper and got in touch with a reporter there at the ready to write about how buddy buddy my dad's ex-boss and the employer at the workshop is. And my brother will be going to the workshop tomorrow and telling them, either you pay us back what you took from us or we'll release the entire thing you did to us to the local newspapers. Not gonna lie, I hope for the latter because I want at least some sort of justice for their absolute BS. My second younger brother and the first one got their friends, and my second younger brother got his friends on Discord, mind you he's in quite a lot of servers, to take a little online stroll to the workshop's public online review page and give their thoughts on the service with the fabulous one star review as their guest. From what I heard from one of my brothers, it took the workshop 10 years to get the review to 5 out of 5 stars and the pettiness and anger of us took it down to somewhere along the lines of 2.9 stars within 5 to 6 hours. It may not have been much, but by god did it feel good to ruin their 10 year efforts for a 5 out of 5 down to a 2.9 out of 5 within a few hours as they deserve. 
And all of this could have been avoided if they'd thought with their crappy heads instead of behaving like stuck-up brats. Be crappy towards my family? Expect to be paid back with the same vibe, sometimes even tenfold. As they say, what goes around comes around. Sorry if this post, more like rant, was long and all over the places. And sorry if it wasn't a satisfying petty revenge, but I just needed to get this off my chest as a foreigner in this country and having had enough of me and my family being treated like crap. I definitely fail to understand what the employer is thinking here. You're at fault for getting assaulted because you had a few hours before work that you could use to run errands? Most businesses are not going to be open after a 10-12 to 12 hour shift that starts at 10 a.m., there literally is no time to run errands after work, so I don't get that employer at all. If you got reached out to, would you join in on this review bomb? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is from Dancing Basilisk. Vice principal went out of her way to make me feel dumb, so I worked my butt off, went to a better university than her, and will be finishing my masters in three months so I can get a higher paying job than her. So first, I just want to clarify that I don't mean to come across as conceited, I'm just feeling vindicated. I had a vice principal in grade school that singled me out for my ADHD symptoms, daydreaming, work avoidance, being too energetic, and would go out of her way to make me feel like the dumbest kid in the whole school. Whenever she talked to my parents, whether it was an actual conference or just a passing conversation in the hallway, she would always find some way to slip into the conversation that, in her opinion, I was slow. When I tested into advanced classes, she was evidently displeased and would keep insinuating that I didn't actually belong there. Her approach toward me really hurt, but I fought tooth and nail to make it through school. I wanted to prove her and others wrong. Fast forward 13 years later, at 22, I was accepted into a master's program with a less than 10% acceptance rate. I'm about to graduate with my master's degree at age 24, heading into a job that has a starting salary of $56,000 a year. I was on LinkedIn and she popped up in the suggested, because apparently she works in my area now. I was curious, so I took a look at her profile and LMFAO, she got demoted to office coordinator. And it turns out that I got into a better university than the one she attended. Soon, I'll be making about 15000 above her salary. And I'm like, this person tried to knock me down and ended up worse off than me. Is it good to revel in someone else's misfortune? No, but it feels really good to know that she was full of it the whole time, and that she expected me to fail, but instead I surpassed her. I feel amazing. Frankly, it's the people like this that inspire us to do so well in our lives, right? I mean, it's not a universal thing, but if somebody tells you that you can't do something that is very realistic, oftentimes you want to use that as motivation to not only do exactly what they're saying you can't do, but surpass it and blow it out of the water, and OP did that. Also, screw any teacher, principal, counselor, or adjacent position that looks down on any kid with any kind of disability. Our next story is from MoggyCat73. Latmate has hardly anything to eat off of now. Living at university in accommodation, and one of our flatmates keeps using everyone else's stuff and then leaves some of it instead of washing it, but won't admit to leaving it and won't wash it because it isn't her stuff. She also expects us to wash her stuff straight after using it, and when I didn't, she called my boyfriend asking him to ask me to wash it since we're essentially the same person now. Anyway, had an argument today, and she said I was a waste of oxygen, then proceeded to use my plates to eat off of and defrost food on, so I moved all of my stuff and two other flatmate stuff out of the cupboard so she can't use them. She now has one plate, one knife, one fork, one spoon, one glass, and no bowls. She can use it again when she apologizes, but until then, they stay out of the communal cupboard. Being petty is great. Update, she's appeared to have magically found more bowls and plates. Amazing what turns up when you don't have other people's stuff to use so they can't. It's really no surprise that somebody like this that's going to try to take advantage of your stuff when having all that stuff taken away, they immediately turn around and don't complain about it, don't apologize for it. They just find another way to just get their way and keep on going. It's definitely a good revenge though because nobody's going to be helping them anymore with any of those dishes and they can't pass it off on it being any of the flatmate stuff. And our next story is from Alpaca Tasty Picnic. 
A very petty drive-by revenge. Six months ago, one of my good friends ghosted me. I'm not sure why, but suddenly my messages weren't getting replied to and I didn't see him at Christmas. I was upset, but I had a few home life problems and tough circumstances all at once, and I didn't have the mental capacity to start chasing after someone. Anyway, today was the first time I'd even spotted my friend. He was at the bus stop outside his house, waiting for a bus. A bus that I knew was going to be at least 20 minutes away. I had been in front of it way back along the road, and had gotten stuck at some traffic lights. Plus there was a huge queue of traffic, and I could tell by his body language that he was late for work and getting to panicking. One of the circumstances I had been dealing with was taking my driving test, and I would passed, despite my nerves and being a mature learner, and bought myself a little car. A little car that I was currently driving past his house and him and was about to drive past his place of work, which is about five minutes walk away from my place of work. A good person would have stopped and offered him a lift. I was not a good person. I coasted past, singing along to my current favorite musical and got to work in time to make myself a cup of coffee and some toast. I wonder how late he was. Yeah, I definitely don't blame OP. If your friend's going to ghost you like that with no explanation, you make a reasonable effort to reach out to them and connect with them, and they just stop responding. I mean, you leave that last conversation and that last attempt to reach out there, and realistically, you just move on. Or maybe some people, upon seeing their friend like that, would actually want to confront them about it. If it were you and you were driving past them, would you want to stop and confront them about ghosting you? Or would you say that they're not even worth your time for ghosting you and just keep on driving? Let me know what you guys would do. Our next story is from Gargoyle Noises. Dumb Karen boss sucks at Excel. So this happened a while ago. I used to work for a medical slash retail center and I had a regional supervisor that I hated. Karen. She was stereotypical. Big blonde Karen cut, heels, attitude, everything. And there were only a handful of people in the company that tolerated her. One day, our entire region, 15 to 20 stores, got an email from her talking about a local sporting event with a theme night that we were all invited to. We got excited, started planning, and got our families involved, per the email. Fast forward a few days later, and a co-worker is talking on the phone to a person at the corporate office, which was local for us. The conversation proceeded as such. The co-worker said, Hey, I'm excited to hang out with you at the game next week. Corporate says, how do you know about that? Coworker says, what do you mean how do I know? Turns out the invitation to the game was only for the corporate office to attend and nobody else was supposed to find out. She wound up making herself look really stupid in front of all her bosses and had to send an apology email to everybody. And if this was the only time she was this tone deaf, I'd have to let it go. But it wasn't and I was pissed. So I kept a lookout for her emails like a good employee and saw that she sent an Excel sheet with some black blots covering the total profit for the stores in the area based on store number. She was known to send emails like this to put emphasis on different metrics to make us look bad without factoring in shift coverage or patience per employee. So I opened it up in Excel, noticed she hadn't actually flattened the image deleted the sensor to expose the confidential info and immediately notified my boss who sent it directly to her boss's boss's boss. In this company, regular employees knowing profits was a huge no-no and unfortunately being a lowly wage slave, I didn't get to learn about the repercussions she faced. But she got fired maybe a month or so after this incident. She met me more than 10 times over my two and a half years and never even bothered to ask my name. And fun fact, I was there longer than her. I actually can't recall what it was, but I remember having some kind of PDF where, because they were like just trying to cover up a signature at the bottom and replace it with their signature, you could actually open it up in a PDF editor and just like delete this white box graphic and you would just see the original person's original signature underneath. It just makes you realize the people who send out confidential documents need to know how to actually secure said documents. Our next story is from Very Bored Panda. Terribly rude office mates. Smells like petty revenge spirit. So my friend worked in an office where they have dozens of small spaces to let. You rent a small room with a sliding glass door. Each room can only fit three to five people, that sort of thing. 
It was good for what they needed in terms of their space, with the caveat being that they were essentially in a fishbowl. Everyone could peer into their workspace, and they could see and hear other people from theirs. Now, since this was all pretty open, everyone was conscientious of their neighbor. Music was kept below a certain volume, phone calls were made with the doors closed, food and dishes were marked in the common areas and kept clean, etc. Everyone, that is, except one office. Shared by at least two guys, this office was loud. They constantly blasted their music, left food out on the shared counters, belched openly, yelled to each other, made weird cartoonish sound effects at high volume, you name it. They were horrible office mates and made work hard for everyone, but especially my friend's group who apparently worked right across from them. Despite sending numerous complaints to the management, the rude neighbors and their ways remain, distracting everyone with an earshot. My friend's group were apparently just going to put up with it, and were even talking about moving to another location within the building when one of the men blasted music during my friend's boss's important phone call, leading to some less than desirable outcomes. I forget what it was, but apparently the boss was just so distracted that they couldn't present properly. Here's where the revenge comes in. Now, for some reason, the team had a bottle of liquid farts. If you know, you know. That stuff is potent. It doesn't go away easily. So they decided to stay late one Friday evening after the office mates had left, put some of it on a napkin, and wipe the bottom of their glass walls with it. The way my friend described it is they slid between the vertical crack where the glass and drywall meet at the edge of the office and wiped up and down near the bottom. This way they didn't damage any property, like the carpet or something, but they'd never suspect the bottom of the glass being the culprit was their reasoning. Monday morning rolls around and the guys apparently took one sniff and complained to management, who investigated the whole office to see if anyone else was impacted by the overwhelming stench. Strangely enough, it was just their office. My friend didn't know what came of the guys. Apparently they just never came back after trying to clean the carpets once, with little effect. Windows, remember? So I guess just be considerate of others, lest you discover what liquid farts smell like. Do you guys think that because this is a rented property that belongs to somebody else, despite those neighbors being bad, that what they did was a little far? Because it's going to be hard for the original owners to try to find and locate where that smell's coming from and clean it? And that could affect their business? Or do they deserve it for allowing such a terrible tenant? I'd like to know your guys' thoughts. Our next story is from Android. Petty revenge or identity theft? This is a story of what I'm sure was meant to be petty revenge against me that backfired spectacularly. I used a pet sitting company last month that, after I was back from my trip, tried to get me to pay another almost 50 British pounds, citing that they hadn't added the surcharge for bank holidays, and tried to guilt me into paying immediately or else they wouldn't be able to do payroll. The only problem with that is they'd already increased the price once before the visit for the exact same reason. When I questioned how it was possible, they broke the charges down, revealing that they were trying to charge me a higher daily cost than I'd agreed to. I responded with the original invoice I'd signed detailing the cost, told them I didn't appreciate them trying to guilt me into overpaying and that I considered this matter over. I then gave them a three-star review on Google slash Trustpilot detailing this experience. I still gave them three stars because after the exchange, It seemed like they were just incompetent rather than malicious, and the cat sitter themselves was good. They saw the review, responded that it was completely unnecessary, and that it was all a big misunderstanding, and then sent me a couple of emails privately calling me rude things. I just screenshotted the emails, attached them to the review, and changed it down to one star. I can only assume they read this subreddit or something similar as they decided to do what a lot of people have done here and give my contact details out to random companies. The only difference is they didn't stick to mailing lists. They actually contacted companies using my details. They've tried to take out loans, applied for university courses, and made bookings for various things like gyms, tutors, and solicitors. In my country, this constitutes as identity theft. And given so far that they've contacted 33 companies over the span of a week, it's quite a severe case. And while companies may not record many details of how someone signs up for a newsletter, 
A lot of them, particularly the solicitors, capture a lot more about the requests to their site, like an IP address, which just so happens to be the same IP that was used to view my signed invoice on the same day the crime started. They're now being investigated by the cyber crimes division of my local police for the identity theft, as well as identity fraud for trying to get loans open in my name. So folks, when you're committing petty revenge, make sure you don't go overboard and don't do it during business hours on the computer you use for work. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, it's one thing signing people up for Scientology mailers and information. You can even go like overboard and sign them up for inappropriate content. But going and trying to get loans taken out with their information, yeah, that's just straight up illegal. Fraud, identity theft. Here's a real tip, if you're gonna try to commit petty revenge, don't do something that is blatantly illegal and can get you prosecuted. Our next story is from Taco Pete's Taco Truck, Petty. Very petty. I used to work help desk, and one day I got yelled at by some low-level manager for not displaying my ID properly. Basically, the lanyard I had on wasn't the company-issued one, and all black, instead of the one with the corp logo. The guy really ripped into me, so much so that people thought I must have done something personal to hurt him. Anyway, after he's done, I grab a soda, try to let it go, realize I can't, so I made it my mission to mess with him. I would randomly lock his account, use our general admin account to change his assigned business group, revoke access to the shared file system, open help desk tickets in his name for things that made him look stupid and so on. He eventually quit because of all the problems with our IT department. I kept messing with him right till the end, around 4 months total, no regrets. I don't really have a lot of empathy for somebody that's going to go and dress somebody down like that for some ridiculous reason. I mean in return picking on them and making them look like an absolute idiot to the point where they just want to quit, maybe a bit far but like... So was them yelling at you like a drill sergeant not wearing your uniform right in front of everybody else. And it's all over a lanyard. Our next story is from Lolly Rocks 12 My ex who abused me and tried to make me quit jujitsu lost all his matches, while I won all of mine at the same tournament. I broke up with my ex about three years ago after a tumultuous relationship. He gaslit me, love bombed me, slut shamed and made me feel like I needed him to do daily tasks. He slowly started to take some of my freedoms away, like driving to work. At first, he insisted on driving me to work to save money, but then it became a thing where it was a way to control how I get to work and when to get off. He isolated me from my friends, made fun of my family, and made me feel like I needed him. Anyways, I started jujitsu around the time I met him, and he was maybe a couple years into it. I was excited to start and learn, and would often try to show my ex some of the moves I learned, because I figured it would be a good way to bond. But instead, every move I showed him that I learned, he would counter it and go rough on me. I simply wanted to show him the move, and not actually fight. When I signed up for a tournament, he refused to show up and support me, and he would often tell me that I'm not very good. It was another way for him to control me. So after that tournament, I placed fourth, which sucked, and he basically had a I told you so attitude. After that, things went downhill for me, and I quit jujitsu for a bit. I broke up with my ex and sulked in my depression. I did, however, get back into jujitsu and started to work harder than ever. I was eventually promoted to blue belt. I started to compete again and lost pretty much the first four tournaments I did. Eventually, I got better and started placing on the podium. This past weekend, I competed and won all of my matches and got gold. I saw my ex at the same tournament, and I panicked a little, but it was fuel for me to fight and win. I noticed that he was still a white belt, and when his match came up, I saw him instantly get choked out. I pointed him out to my teammate, and we both had a laugh. It was a beautiful sight to see and my ex lost all of his matches and placed dead last. It was one of the best weekends I've had. Winning at something I was told I would suck at, and seeing the person who told me this, lose. All I gotta say is OP's ex seems exceptionally bad at jujitsu, or hasn't been working at it because if you've been at it for a few years and they're still a white belt, meaning they've never gotten ranked above the very first beginner level of jujitsu, they are doing something wrong. This next story is from Dog Cat Cat Doggy. 
Your crappy flooring company is now a bathroom on Google Maps. I can't believe it lets you do this, but hey, it worked. I just had a pretty bad experience with a flooring installer. I'm in a small town in a non-Western country who just never showed up. I had paid my deposit, so really it was a matter of how many times did I want to call him a day asking when he was going to show up. When he did come finally, he did nothing but complain about how hard this was going to be, etc. It was so annoying, so I asked him to leave his scraper tool so I could do it myself. He said he'd come to help me the following day, and of course he never did. He came again today after the usual two messages, where are you? Except this time, I let it be known that this was the last time I was going to be so polite. I've wasted several days waiting on him when he never told me he had any intention of ever coming. So anyways, he's taking forever, but my arms are too sore from the day before, so I can't continue. He goes outside and starts complaining about me to another worker, about how annoying I am, always asking when he's going to come by. I did him a favor and cut him off and let him know I can hear him and his job is officially over. He's free to leave and I want my money back. He didn't leave and tried bargaining, which is infuriating now that I think about it because who the freak does that? Talks crap and doesn't respect the homeowner. So instead of leaving a nasty review, I noticed I could edit the listing on Google Maps. I changed their company to a public bathroom that's open 24 hours. Apparently it turns out that editing a listing on Google Maps like that only edits just the personal person's map. It's not actually like updating the worldwide map. But man, they deserve to be a toilet company, because this flooring company hires the exact same stuff that goes inside one. And our final story of the day is by JC1093. He stole my work, told the teacher I took his, so I got revenge. During college, I was doing a course on health and social care, and as that's something I specialize in, and some classmates knew that, I helped many with their coursework. One day, one of the people, Sean, I was helping with coursework, decided to copy all of my coursework I had on my laptop and turn it in as his own. A few days later, I was called into the tutor's office with Sean about the recent coursework that was just handed in and that both of ours was identical. Sean then said, OP must have copied me. I was stunned silent, but I didn't say anything because I knew that the tutor wouldn't believe him, and even if he did, he wouldn't be able to answer anything from the coursework. The tutor said, As I can't tell who copied, I'm going to give you one week to redo this coursework. Sean said, But I worked so hard on that coursework, it isn't fair. I smiled and said, Thank you, and asked if I could get started. The tutor agreed, and both Sean and I left. A couple days later, Sean called me and apologized for copying my work, and asked if I could help him. I agreed only because I had a plan to get him back. I told him to come around mine tomorrow afternoon and I can help him. I had 24 hours to get ready, so I made a fake coursework paperwork with wrong statements, laws, and coursework and saved it on my laptop. Sean came around and I went to the toilet to leave him with my laptop. And he sent it in again stating it was his own work, but this time decided to delete it from my laptop so I wouldn't send it in as my own. Two days later, Sean calls me and swears and shouts at me for ruining his coursework and making him look like an idiot. I told him you deserve it for stealing and hung up. He ignored me for the rest of the year. Background info. 1. Everyone knew I did my work on my laptop as my handwriting is terrible. 2. I'm guessing Sean used a USB to take the coursework. 3. The coursework was about mental capacity. 4. My laptop didn't have a password. 5. The tutor was a very calm and neutral person. 6. I specialize in health and social care due to many years working in the industry and my own problems. 7. The coursework Sean copied was wrong laws and statements regarding mental capacity. I love Sean's thinking here regardless because, honestly, anybody worth their salt with computers would understand that even though Sean went and deleted those files, it probably takes less than 5 minutes to go and recover those. There's plenty of programs out there like Recuva where if you delete a file, you go and open Recuva immediately, navigate to that folder you deleted it from, and just let the program search. Chances are you'll be able to recover any document right then and there no problem. Now of course in this situation it clearly didn't matter to OP at all, it was just a fake bomb coursework. But it just goes to show that Sean here is like a zero IQ thief. 
thinks they can try to steal, get away with it, and rush it through being like, this is my work, I did it myself. I found the man that stole $48,982 from me. About six years ago, just a year after I graduated from uni, I was scammed in one of the worst ways imaginable. My boyfriend, now ex at the time, was the only partner I'd had for a while, pretty much all of my uni days. Because when you're going to college in a big city after living in a small town, you can easily latch onto the first and easiest connections you make. And that's exactly what I did. I was completely devoted to him for the four years that our relationship lasted, and he absolutely wasn't. This may seem irrelevant to my actual revenge story, but it helps to understand why and how I could have been so gullible in the actual theft. I was really young when I got into uni, and I was extremely clueless, so I was always misunderstanding social cues and things like that. You can imagine how rough my awkwardness was. Then I met this cute boy outside the coffee shop where I worked part-time while I was in uni before becoming the manager of the chain after I graduated. Trust me, that's the only good bit of the story. Anyways, he was the city boy and I was the clueless small southern girl and it was a terribly written ebook come to life. I worshipped the ground he walked on, he worshipped the ground my roommate walked on, and I caught them going at it on the kitchen counter I'd scrubbed painlessly the night before that unfaithful morning. The breakup tore me apart, but I think it was made worse by the fact that I had to handle the rent for a midtown two bedroom apartment. But I didn't want to get stuck in that situation again. Not that I had the hopes of finding another boyfriend ASAP, but I didn't want to go through that. Oh, I'm building a great friendship with someone, and then a man comes into the picture, and they realize they don't like being a good person as much as they like sucking so-and-so, and they decide to treat me like crap, taking my man and my rent along with them. Been there, done that, was on a long road to recovery, and never wanted to do it again. So although my Craigslist ad was very non-gender specific, I was only responding to male applicants that gave off heterosexual vibes and women that seemed overtly religious or overtly homosexual. I believe I already implied I wasn't taking any chances, right? Now this is the part where things started getting murky, because I was bone deep in depression. I had a very loose version of a checklist for my perfect roommate, and because of how hurt I was, my only requirement was no strange women allowed so he had to be straight and not a criminal. But time would tell that I was a little bit dumb in the way I checked that last bit because, back then, all I did was ask, any criminal record? And kept it moving after they all quite obviously said no. At the end of the process, I was stuck with two potential new roommates, and I closed my eyes, shuffled their applications, prayed for luck and chose one. With my track record, I probably should have avoided any context involving luck, But the one thing I didn't lose after this whole ordeal is my optimism. I guess it's in my DNA. Anyway, back to the recap. So I chose this person, let's call him Steve, because I think Steve's an ideal name to characterize a thief. Steve the Thief. So I called Steve, told him to come by the house for a final discussion. We agreed on the rent, payment schedule, bill sharing, kitchen rules, and pretty much the basics. I didn't particularly have an issue with anything he said because I wasn't looking to be impressed. I just wanted someone who didn't remind me of the man I'd lost every time they walked around topless. My ex-roommate had my ex-boyfriend's head buried in her chest when I caught them, so naturally I felt like Steve the Thief was a great choice, and because it was the first month, I had to bear the cost for all of the bills since I'd already paid about 90% of them by the time I found Steve. And throughout the two weeks of terror, he kept insisting that I keep tabs of everything because he was certain he would pay at the beginning of the next month when he was fully moved in. I guess he didn't realize he would end up paying, but I'll save that for later. So for about a week, he didn't stay in the apartment, but I thought that made sense because he was probably cleaning out his old place. Then he showed up the weekend after our agreement and he came with tons and tons of packing boxes. In my wondering about how much stuff he had, I didn't pay much attention to anything else about the boxes for a while. Then everything started going downhill after a week of Steve moving into my apartment. I call that week the peak of my rebound season because I'd had the most meaningless one night stands after my breakup. But on a hunt to be less lonely this time, I just wanted someone, or more accurately, a few people, to make me forget. But I'd slowed down the train when my new roommate moved in. Out of courtesy, of course. 
However, by the time he moved in with the tons of boxes, I picked up where I left off and skyrocketed into sexual indulgence. I had one night stands every other night, and there were some repeat features in the mornings and afternoons. Two separate events but the same person. And I was getting to the point that I was detaching emotions from sex. But the downside is my haze of sadness was weakening, and I was starting to see things a bit clearer. And that's when I noticed that things were going missing in the apartment. At first, they were things I wouldn't really have noticed if I wasn't observing the apartment with post-nut clarity. But each time I turned back to my room, after closing the front door behind my guest of the night or morning out, I noticed that something seemed out of place in the living room. But one thing stayed constant. Steve's pile of boxes. Anyway, I convinced myself that I was being silly, kept it casual with my roommate since he abided by the rules, and had his own string of loud nights and giggling. But then it got very obvious that I was missing some things in the house. I had subconsciously been listing things that were gone from the house when I realized that my 21st birthday gift, a Michael Jordan autographed basketball, was gone from its shelf on the wall. I sat down to make a list of things that had mysteriously disappeared. They were all little things that had some monetary value, like an engraved paperweight, a set of fancy wine glasses, and a pair of studded earrings. But when the Jordan autographed basketball, which was estimated to be worth about a thousand dollars, went missing, I was worried. Up to that point, I'd summed up the disappearances to my carelessness in letting the one night stand spend more time than necessary in my house, while I was asleep. But at that point, I hadn't had anyone over in a while, so I had to confront my roommate, and he was very visibly taken aback that I would think that he or any of his guests would have stolen the basketball. Then he started making some points, which sounded very valid at the time. He talked about how he was constantly in his room whenever he was in the house, how the living room was the entry and exit point for both our guests, and how I may have moved the basketball without remembering because... Didn't you mention to me your cheating ex-boyfriend got you that basketball? It felt like a eureka moment because I was actively trying to remember the last time I'd actually seen the basketball, and I was certain that it'd been so long that it was probably in storage or I'd given it out to any of my friends. So I apologized. Yes, believe it or not, I did apologize, and decided to end the conversation about it right there and then. He put up an attitude for a few days, but ultimately we fell back into the casual friendship we had. I stopped bringing men back to the apartment, and I noticed that the items had stopped disappearing, or so I thought. It was now fully a month since Steve had been living with me, but he hasn't paid his due bills for over a week. Not enough to cause worry because I didn't have to actually pay for anything till like later in the month, but we had an agreed schedule, and I was getting a little iffy about it. So I called him for a little convo in the kitchen. I explained that, logically, he'd spent a month in the apartment already, and our agreement was over a month old and blah blah blah. I needed him to pay his share of the bills, and throughout my entire spiel, he was quietly nodding so I felt relieved that we weren't about to have a huge confrontation. Then Steve explained how he'd recently started doing freelance graphic design for a new company remotely, hence the constant staying in his room, and his paycheck hasn't cleared yet. It sounded reasonable, and this was back when remote work wasn't as popular, so it felt valid that processing payment wouldn't be a seamless experience. As a matter of fact, I think I felt some level of pity for him. Big mistake. Big, big mistake. Now, remember that the mysterious disappearances had stopped, but Steve's boxes were still littering the apartment living room? That was my first sign but I hadn't caught on to it. Then, what my friends like to call the big steal happened and all heck broke loose. I got back from work one day and the apartment oven was gone. Like a huge gaping hole was occupying the space the oven used to be in the kitchen and it felt like the world was playing a very bad, unfunny joke on me. A $1,200 oven just upped and left the apartment? Highly unlikely. Immediately I walked over to Steve's door and banged till he opened it. Here's the thing, I'd never seen him inside his room and he'd been living in my apartment for almost two months at this point. But when he opened it, I saw nothing that screamed that he was actually a designer. No multiple screens, no casually discarded scribbles, 
and none of this occurred to me till much later because I was freaking out about having to explain the situation to my landlord. As expected, Steve was adamant that he didn't know about it, that he'd heard sounds earlier but thought I was home and tinkering. And then he threw in the winning line. Remember that the guys next door got robbed last week and we were supposed to change the locks? And I felt immensely stupid. There was no way Steve would have stolen the oven and remained in the apartment cool as a cucumber. Well, I was only right about one part of that. There was no way Steve was going to remain in the apartment. I ended up paying my landlord $2,000 for the price of a new oven and cost of installation plus wiring. It was a very bad week, but I didn't know how much worse it was going to get. The oven theft occurred on Monday, and when I was going to the apartment door on Friday, it was with the full intention of kicking up my feet with several glasses of wine. But I ended up at the police station that night. The apartment had been emptied out completely. My television, the kitchen appliances, everything down to my straightener was gone. The only things left behind were my documents and some of Steve's boxes. I have experienced grief and loss since this incident, but I promise very little comes close to the extent of helplessness I felt that evening. What happened was that Steve had slowly been taking bits of my belongings and putting them into packing boxes hidden in plain sight, and when it became obvious that I was suspicious, he moved them from the apartment. The oven was his test to see how stupid I was, and I broke the scale so he could carry out with the grand audit of my apartment. But I didn't find out about any of these until almost a year later. I was in debt for over three months after Steve robbed me blind, and I became even more depressed because bad luck doesn't even begin to quantify what I was experiencing. Of course, I called the police, and when they vetted all the information Steve provided, I don't think anyone was shocked to find out that it was all false down to his name. CCTV from the street showed that he had loaded a van with most of the items in packing boxes and taken the larger things out through the fire escape behind the building, which is a blind spot. I had to pay the landlord back for everything that was pre-installed and I was racking up losses left and right. Luckily, I had leave days piled up at work, so I was able to focus on rebuilding my life. I moved out of that apartment because it was the constant factor in all the BS I went through in the period of that one year. My total expense and loss from Steve's grand theft, unpaid rent and bills summed up to $48,982. And since the police were more focused on reminding me that I'd made a series of stupid choices, I knew that the case was gone with the wind. But as luck would have it, I got a promotion about six months after the incident and started planning for a vacation. One of my friends and co-workers decided to join me for a road trip to a nearby state where we would lodge for the weekend, drink, and indulge in multiple vices. At this point, I hadn't fully recovered from the whole drama with the theft and the breakup. My ex-boyfriend and ex-roommate got engaged shortly after Steve stole from me, but I was in a much better place. So we planned the trip and weekend, and about a year after the whole thing happened, we pulled over for a gas stop, just one stretch of road to our destination, and that's when I got my shot at revenge. My coworker, let's call her Beth, was one of the few people who knew the full story about what happened, because I didn't want more people than necessary to know that I'd been well and truly stupid. Anyway, so she knew about it. And when I gasped as she got into the semi-busy line of cars at the gas station, she followed my gaze and immediately figured out that I was staring at Steve seated in a pickup truck. She quickly reversed the car and pulled over to the side of the gas station, and we watched as Steve jumped out of the truck, left the windows rolled down, and walked into the gas station store. I told her I had a plan and I needed the bag of weed and LSD that I knew she had on her. Beth's a bit of a wildcat. My plan was simple. Because this was back when traveling interstate with marijuana without a medical prescription was prohibited, and I just had to plant Beth's absurd amount of illegal substances. She had a medical card for her anxiety and previous jolt of cancer, so she got away with carrying weed around back then in Steve's car. We got out of the car, Beth covered my smaller frame as I tossed the weed and pills to the floor of his driver's seat. Then we walked back to the car and called the cops. I kept it brief 
explained that he'd stolen from me, and I still had the fake documents he had tendered for his application, mentioned his plate number, and I just slid it in there that I'd just seen him buy what looked like marijuana at a gas station. With an efficiency that was missing the first time I tried to get Steve arrested, the police got to the gas station very quickly. Beth and I were already getting gas in the car when a cop car pulled up, and one of the two policemen in it announced that the owner of the pickup with Steve's plate should step out of the store. Through the glass windows, I saw Steve look confused at the checkout station before turning towards the doors where the policemen were standing behind their open doors. Steve walked out of the gas station and asked the officers if there was a problem. They led him to his car, searched, and found the weed. The moment Steve saw the bag, he was obviously confused and kept looking around. But he made the singular mistake that would have helped him out. When the officer asked, is this yours? He grabbed the bag for a closer look, got his prints all over it, and then said, no. The policeman told him that they had to bring him in. And when they pulled into the city's police station, we were right behind them. As soon as Steve stepped out of the cop car and saw me, he started screaming that I was the one who planted it, and when they asked if he knew me, he couldn't answer because that would have implied that he should establish how he knows me, which would have led to $48,982 worth of stuff he took. Long story short, I identified myself as the caller, the police questioned him, and got us scheduled for a hearing. Steve was held on bail for theft and illegal possession of marijuana. The court process was fast because I got a statement of the first report I made and Steve was ordered to pay me $60,000 for the cost of stolen property and damages. Beth and I chose a different destination for another vacation and had a great time. And I've been more conscious and careful than ever because I got lucky when I found Steve the thief and I never want to relive that experience again. Although I collected every last dollar he stole from me, and then some, approximately $10,000 more, but hey, that's enough to cover the emotional and physical stress I went through. Have you ever in your life had an experience that felt as lucky as what OP experienced here? Going to a whole totally different state, pulling into a gas station, and running into the person that stole $50,000 from them? Do you think you've ever felt nearly that lucky in your life? Let me know in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is a story of a man keeping their kids from their ex-wife. I was married for 15 years, and at the end of marriage, I hated my ex-wife more than I ever loved her. To be honest, now that I'm looking back at what my life with that woman was, I realize I was playing a part up until the very end, and my role was the clown. My ex-wife, let's call her Karen, was the circus master. And whenever she needed something, I was the willing volunteer who put my neck on the line. I sold my first car to buy her second car, and no, it doesn't make any sense, but at the time, I can't go on a road trip in an SUV, I need a convertible to fully immerse the experience, was a convincing argument for me. I was a loser, or as most of you would agree, a total simp. Karen's word was life and truth for the better part of our marriage. It was so bad that, at one point, my 14-year-old son was convinced that I was the originator of the concept of simping because I allowed their mother to take off for the weekend because she said she needed a break from parenting. To put it into context, we have a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 4-year-old. And every single one of our kids had an event that weekend. My 14-year-old had his first baseball match on Friday afternoon, and his friend's birthday party was on Sunday. My 12-year-old had to be dropped off for ballet class on Saturday morning. My 8-year-old had a play date on Saturday morning as well, and I had to pick her up later in the day. And my 4-year-old was scheduled for the dentist's office at midday on Saturday. The kids knew it was a busy weekend, and their mother knew, and I knew. But that Thursday morning, my wife came down to the breakfast table with a travel bag packed to the brim and a beach hat under her arm. Bethy's having her birthday weekend getaway, so I'll see you guys on Monday when you get back from school. The first part was said to me, the second part was said to the kids as she gave them forehead kisses. Interrupting the breakfast, I woke up at 5am to prepare, since she slept in almost every weekday. I couldn't figure out what to say to that, but I didn't have to. My eldest son spoke up, but there's so much we have to do this weekend, can't you miss it? And uh, that's when she dropped the bit about needing time off from parenting. 
which was, in itself, a blatant joke when she was not just a bad mother, she wasn't a mother, period. My friends and I joke that the only good thing she did for my kids was carrying them to term and delivering them safely. Beyond getting pregnant, which she loved because she could order me around without needing an elaborate excuse, and giving birth, which she hated because she had to spend months recovering from what she called baby body, my wife didn't do much else. But she was great at being a trophy wife, and now that I'm being truthful about my marriage and life in the past 15 years, I know that was the reason why I married her. It was the reason why I gave her my annual salary bonus. I work in tech as senior management, so you can imagine how many zeros were in that wire transfer, so she could get a BBL and recuperate in Hawaii. My ex-wife was beautiful, and that's all there was to her. But for 15 years, it was all I needed to make the marriage work. She looked good in the family photos, and she looked good at my company dinners, and she put my handle in her Instagram bio as husband, so I was convinced that she just didn't have maternal instincts or the ability to be romantically expressive, and I filled her shoes anywhere and everywhere I could. But the thing with that is she prefers stilettos to slippers, and I'm using that as an analogy for everything imaginable. When she was pregnant with her third child, she couldn't stop craving mangoes, which is a slippers type of thing, right? But she wanted the mangoes specifically from a farmer's market three states away, hence the stilettos. And I didn't mind. In fact, I never noticed or had any attention drawn to it until the breakfast event. As the door closed behind her that morning, my eldest son said to me that I was the biggest simp he had ever known, without mincing words, of course, and I just laughed it off. I was stuck in my clown season as I now refer to it, and it took a lot to convince me that I had a huge red nose on my face before I faced reality truly. And it took the threat of losing my children, the only real thing in that marriage, for me to see that I was wasting my life away. But before I get to the juicy part of my revenge on the worst person I've ever had the unfortunate luck of meeting, I need to explain how stupid I was so you guys can understand how satisfying it was to find common sense once again. And no, juggling that crazy weekend wasn't my undoing. In fact, for a long time, it was the primary argument she used whenever I tried to get her to do anything. I can't skip my spa day to take the kids to the park. I can't make dinner. I can't attend the recital. But I'm sure you can handle it. Remember that weekend in July and how everything was perfect? And I would just nod and turn into a human octopus. The only bright side of overworking myself as a parent was the fact that my children love me. Maybe the universe pities me in the stupidest decisions of my life marrying Karen, but I'm truly blessed with the smartest, amazing, beautiful children. Despite the worse than imaginable mother figure they have, my children are empathetic and kind and a constant reminder that I've done something right in raising them. The person I did it with? Absolutely regrettable. Have you ever met someone and wondered why everything seems to fall into place so easily? Well, you shouldn't trust them. I did and it was the worst mistake I ever made. I met my ex-wife just as I left the optometrist's office with my brand new glasses. 2020 vision, right? But I couldn't see the disaster right in front of me until it was almost too late. I wish I could say that I saw the signs, but it's taken long nights of drinking with my friends, expensive therapy sessions, and a ton of introspection to admit that I let so many things pass without noticing them, much less addressing things that were so terribly wrong with my marriage. Towards the end of my marriage with Karen, the red flags got larger, more crimson, and I was more oblivious than I should have been with four children looking up to me to shield them from the world and their mother. In one particularly sobering event, my wife left my children alone at home and went for an office mixer at the publishing company where she works as an office assistant because a big shot from the company was rumored to be arriving from out of town, and she wanted to be photographed at the event. And where was I? at the hospital with my mother who had just come out of hip replacement surgery. I raised my voice at my wife for the first time in our marriage the next morning, and even then I wasn't addressing the actual issue. Rather than rip her a new one for leaving the children, I kept repeating, why didn't you call me to come home and pick them up? I was willing to leave my mother in the hospital 
Go on a one-hour trip home, get the kids ready for an uncomfortable night in the hospital waiting room, and drive another hour to the hospital just for my wife to get her shot in the photo album for a welcome party. I wanted to be the one responsible for everything she couldn't do for my kids. Like babysitters aren't an option. Like my then 12 year old son wasn't old enough to get his siblings into a waiting cab. I didn't consider any other options and even in my anger I was offering myself as a first alternative. My therapist says I wanted her to need me but I think it was more about needing her to need me. For weeks leading up to the end of my marriage, it felt like the world was just passing by while I stood on the sidelines. And when I began to snap out of the trance I was stuck in, it was almost too late. It started with a rather climatic event like all things do. She forgot our four-year-old son at the mall for six hours. It was one of those rare days when she showed more than an ounce of emotion towards our children and she had wanted to take them on a trip to the mall so he could check out the new play center near the food court. If I had been more careful about her intentions or more conscious of her flaws, I would have probably realized that there was a luxury beauty store opening on the top floor of the mall. But I didn't know till I got to the mall that night, frantic and worried to the grays on my head. Basically, she had dropped my son at the play center and gone to the store's opening five floors away. She had my credit card because I was the elated husband, excited that she was spending time with our child. And instead, she had spent about $5,000 on heaven knows what. Apparently, she saw one of her friends at the opening and they spent the next few hours touring the mall before heading out for a drink, completely forgetting that she had a child in the building. When she got home at 6 p.m., her arms were loaded with bags, but empty of our son. And she didn't realize it until our other children asked about their brother. My eldest daughter's shout of, where is he, was what had me storming down the stairs. I found my ex-wife and three of our children standing and staring at each other in the living room. And all my mental alarms went off. That was it. There was no coming back from that. I knew it, she knew it, and our kids knew it. Wasting no time at all, I asked about the last place she saw him, where she went, and a million other questions that raced against my heart as I thought about what I did wrong to have deserved a life like that with a wife like that. When I heard her say she left the mall with a friend she saw at the opening, my subconscious mind did a recap of the past 15 years, and it felt like I was a stranger in my own life. But I couldn't deal on the new realization because my child was missing somewhere and that was the best case scenario for a curious, hungry and tired four year old. Pray that he's alive. Just pray that he's alive. That was the only thing I said to her as I ran out of the house with my eldest son. I've already mentioned that my children are quite smart and that night was proof of it. The only number my four year old knew was 911 and I just started teaching him how to remember the house phone number so I knew he couldn't have called. But after he noticed that his mother wasn't coming back for him, he had found a security guard, told her his name and told her that he didn't know where his mom was. The security guard had taken him to the main security office after making several announcements and reporting the case to the police, waiting to see if someone would turn up in search of my son. I didn't realize how shaken I was by it till my baby boy was wiping my tears after I hugged him when we were reunited. That night, after tucking my kids in, I called my lawyer and told him I wanted to file for a divorce. And that was the beginning of a new series of unfortunate events. But I was more aware of what was going on. Everything that Karen was doing, I was able to see it before she did, and I fought back twice as hard. She didn't know what was going on, and I took advantage of that to the max. Karen wanted to pull the strings, and I had snapped them in half. When she got the divorce papers, she was visibly confused because we were still living in the same house, and life had continued as if nothing changed. But something had happened, and I was never going back into that mindset where everything she did was perfect. I wanted our divorce to be a very simple split because I didn't want to give our children any additional trauma to the years of neglect they had to suffer from their mother. But Karen wouldn't go out with a bang. My lawyer drew up a simple plan for shared custody and spousal payment. But Karen found a lawyer, who I'm pretty sure she slept with because she didn't have the finances to cover an average lawyer's fees, who she was able to convince to help her get full custody, spousal payment, and child support payment. 
I had spent 15 years financing Karen's life and she wanted me to continue financing it for another 14 years. What she hadn't taken into account is the fact that I had had enough of her and her scheming ways. She put my child's life in danger because I never let her consider an alternative to her selfishness, and she was about to find out how terrible it could be to not have her way. My lawyer advised it would be best to have a judge hear my case and grant the ultimate decision, so we went to battle it out in court and Karen played her last hand. She arrived with a black eye and busted lip. In all the years I'd known her, I could maybe agree that she was selfish and mischievous, but to the point of self-harm to satisfy her greed? Probably not. Goes to show you how little you can know about someone you live with. Anyway, my lawyer saw her appearance and knew that the case was as good as gone because my kids were unable to testify in court, and given that her account of me being violent with her would play into an argument of manipulation, and I let him and Karen believe that I'd lost and given up. She only knew me as her doormat, so I guess she didn't expect anything else. But two weeks after the first child support and spousal payment I made to Karen, my 14-year-old and I came up with a plan that changed my future, and possibly the nature of my criminal record, He'd been texting me with updates about their living situation since I had to leave the house after the divorce was settled. And to say it got worse would be an understatement. My son was taking up full responsibility for himself and his siblings, while Karen reminded them at every possible chance that she was a good person and I was never going to come for them. So it's safe to say that two months later, when she came home to an empty house with no children and none of the property documents, she was very surprised. I didn't want to put my children through the horrors of an extended court case, and I couldn't deal with the thought of applying for shared custody with Karen. If it were up to me, I wouldn't live on the same planet with her. So I put in for a semi-permanent remote placement at work, had my teenage son pack their things slowly over a week, and borrowed a Chevy Suburban so it would be one single trip. And two months ago, on a bright sunny Saturday afternoon, I stole my kids from my ex-wife while she was out shopping. The entire time, I was second guessing the decision and having an extreme internal debate about whether it was the right thing to do or not. But seeing my young kids cry after we pulled away from the old house was all the convincing I needed. There was no wrong in giving my children the life they deserve. I was tired of doing things based on the convenience and comfort of my ex-wife, so I stole my kids with a well-detailed plan. I carefully highlighted the loopholes in my wife's initial testimony, aka lie, to provide my lawyer with accurate information for a defense, and I reported a new case of neglect to law enforcement. Shout out to my eldest son for the brilliant act he put up to the police. Not that he lied outrightly, but... He may have embellished the truth when he told the cops that his mother left a pot on fire, he had made a lunch for his siblings, and left the door open while they ran out to meet me in the car, and left his baby brother in the bathtub, more like a toy left behind after the toddler's morning bath, before heading out for drinks with a friend. We had the perfect story. We found a new judge, and we got her to listen. My story tallied with the kids, the security guard at the mall was willing to help me get CCTV footage, plus a witness account, and my friends were able to submit eyewitness accounts. All of these, plus the fact that my kids reported their neglect several hours before she called the police station searching for them, made for a very convincing case, and I got full custody. And she's facing possible charges for neglect and manipulating evidence in a court case. These days, I work for my new home on the other side of town, and I have my kids by my side. I definitely feel for OP, the wife sounds like an absolute nightmare, and frankly, I don't think there's any greater nightmare than having your four children that you love to bits stuck with somebody with full custody that does not care one bit about them. I think one thing's for certain about OP here, they were going to go at bat to get their kids back and give their kids the life they deserve, one way or another, and ultimately they pulled it off. Monitoring my movements? Enjoy the spam! About four years back, I had a colleague who worked in a different office to me. He was a nice enough guy, but just generally annoying on emails. Anyway, one week he was down in my office for work, and sitting next to me, and I caught a glimpse that he had tagged me on Skype for business. So whenever I went offline, away, or active, he got a pop-up notification. 
For whatever reason that really bugged me, I don't like the idea that someone's monitoring my movements. Once he went back to his home office, every time I left and came back to my laptop, or was bored or on a call, including with him, I'd flick my status on and off 10 to 20 times. I knew every time he was getting these pop-ups, and he couldn't really say anything to me without admitting it. I still chuckled to myself about it to this day. Now I'm not sure if Skype has a setting like this on by default, but I know I've used programs before or apps that when you're using it and somebody comes online, you do get a little pop-up notification. If you're using a program that notifies you every single time somebody comes online or offline that's on your friends list or associated to your account, do you think it's weird to like having that on? Getting those notifications every time somebody comes online or offline? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is from Week Assignment 5091. Green Day helped me get a vindictive neighbor to move. This happened about a decade ago, but I still get satisfaction when I think of it. So around 10 years ago, we had to move out of the duplex we shared with my father-in-law. He was a jerk and a bully and had no boundaries. Because he owned the duplex, he thought he could do whatever he wanted, including walking into my unit unannounced while I'm barely clothed. So we left and moved into a beautiful place a good distance away from him. After I pushed father-in-law down the stairs when he threatened me for the last time when my husband was gone. The tenants who lived in my unit had been there for over a decade, and it was a woman in her 50s and her physically disabled son. They were very quiet. The man who lived under me was absolutely pissed that he lost his peace when a family of four and a dog moved in. It was a huge place, and realistically, if it hadn't been us, we were friends of the owner, it would have been another family who also wouldn't have been as quiet as the previous tenants. The downstairs tenant's name was Frank, and he was a threatening bully from the start, except he wouldn't complain to me if my husband was home. He would wait until his work truck was gone and catch me outside alone when checking the mail. He was a huge guy too. I'm only 5'2 and weighed maybe 140 pounds back then. So we moved away from one jerk, only to find a bigger one who seemed to try anything he could to get us in trouble. When he realized he couldn't make us move or make my kids, 4 and 6 at that time, be any more quiet than they already were, they lived in an upstairs unit and knew not to be too loud indoors, he moved on to my dog. Within a couple of weeks of moving in, we started getting bylaws showing up about my loud dog. My dog wasn't loud and only barked when someone knocked on the door, which didn't look great for me when the bylaw showed up. Then he started recording the dog barking for that minute someone knocked and would call the landlord and play it every time I brought my kids to school. So I left my webcam on and a friend watched and listened while we were gone and the dog didn't make a peep. A few days later, I get another bylaw visit, and they gave me a fine. Except I hadn't left the freaking house in days, and the dog barked only once when I got a package delivered. Now onto my revenge, muhaha. After I get another fine from bylaw that was significantly higher than the first, most cities' bylaw department only responds when there's a complaint lodged, they don't go looking for people to ticket, and with absolutely no proof to justify a $230 fine, I had enough. We'd been there only a month by this time, and this jerk made my life even more difficult than my father-in-law did. I decided that I'm going to leave for the day with my kids and my dog. I put them in the car, and then went back upstairs to lay my subwoofer on the floor exactly in the middle of his apartment downstairs. I put Green Day's greatest hits on full blast, pressed play, and left. That freaker wanted noise? Wanted to complain and get me fined for no reason? Well, I was about to give him a reason. I knew my landlord was out of the country on vacation, so there wouldn't be anyone calling to harass me from Greece. I was gone for about six hours and the album was on repeat. I must have really pissed him off because by the weekend, he had moved out. I get major satisfaction from winning this game, still over a decade later. I'm just struggling to understand how they can record the dog barking, you know, maybe a few times a week, and just that sole recording of the dog barking when the door's being knocked on is enough to get OP fined over and over again. Bylaw clearly didn't care about getting the true facts of the situation because the neighbor's recording probably shouldn't have gone for more than a couple minutes at most. I mean, I highly doubt the dog was barking for more than five minutes. So to me, the fact that this neighbor got away with reporting them and OP getting a fine for it 
because they stopped to take a two minute recording every so often when the dog barked is kind of an outrage to me. Our next story is from Colonia Venus. Glassdoor infuriated me by making me sign up and give them personal info to view something, so I left them a bad employee review on their own site. Listen, this might sound a bit extra, but have you tried to use Glassdoor before? If you haven't, go try it. I'm serious. See how far you get before it harasses you into signing up for their site. But I can just simply sign in with my Google account, you say? Wrong. It won't let you back to the viewing page after signing in. No, it forces you to give them details about your job. Your job title, your company, your location, your salary, your years of experience. Although there is thankfully a skip button when it gets to the review part, it's hard to even notice it, and it tries to force you into it again later. Okay, I kind of get it, they need data, that's what makes the website useful, but here's the problem. I don't have a freaking job. I graduated college last year, had some health issues, etc. So what the heck should I enter when it's forcing me to answer questions about my job? Is it ironic that they're withholding information that could help me get a job because I don't already have a job? Or is it prejudiced against the unemployed? I can't decide. I'll tell you what. Job title? Male prostitute? Company? Glass door? Location? Las Vegas, Nevada? Salary? $69,000? All ratings? One star? Pros? Five word minimum? None. There are no pros. Cons? My talents are truly going to waste at Glassdoor. No one wants to hire me to screw them because the company's website is the most atrocious thing they've ever had to interact with on the internet. I don't blame them, frankly. How can they trust me to give them a good time if this is the company I represent? No one's having a good time on this website. No one. Glassdoor, get a freaking UX team. If you have one already, get a new one. This crap stinks. Advice for management? Fix your website. Forcing people into signing up and giving reviews to simply view a page that they got to from a search engine is really freaking obnoxious and completely unhelpful for people looking for their first job. You're forcing people to give false data when you do this. How is that helpful for anyone? Give people the option to skip it. No one wants to sign up for your site when you force them. Sincerely, a male prostitute who just handed in his resignation. I seriously doubt it'll ever make it to their page of public reviews, which looks rigged as crap by the way, but I just hope that SOME employee that is complicit in this heinous design choice reads it. My review fell short of the level of copypasta vibes I was hoping for, so if anyone wants to improve upon it in the comments, please do. In conclusion, Glassdoor's website has the freaking temperament of a sleazy frat boy who won't take no for an answer. Wait, no. Glassdoor's website is the virtual embodiment of an arrogant, crusty old businessman who invites his young female intern to a private meeting to discuss promoting her only to say that it's contingent upon her performing an inappropriate favor. Yes, I'm still angry. I've dealt with too many dysfunctional websites lately, so this was the last straw. Apologies that this isn't really a triumphant petty revenge story. In all honesty, this is partially an attempt at a cathartic writing exercise, and partially the next step in my campaign to tarnish their name. No offense intended to male prostitutes, frat boys, businessmen, or anyone else. Full offense intended to the employees at Glassdoor who made their website like this. Screw them. Screw them. Having spent my fair share of time on the internet, I totally agree with OP. I haven't experienced Glassdoor, but a website that I've visited quite a bit that infuriated me is Quora. Do you know how many times I've found a question that is answered on Quora, and as soon as you go there, you see one answer, and then it's like, sign up. So at some point you give in, you're like, okay, I used this site a little bit, you sign up for it, and then it starts asking you for Quora Plus, and then there's certain answers on certain questions that you can only read if you have Quora Plus. I sit there looking at that and I'm like, who's going to pay so and so much a month to read a slightly better answer? Also, unless you like giving away all the personal information attached to your Google account or any other account, I would advise against signing in using your Google account or a lot of times you'll see like sign in with Apple, sign in with Facebook. When you sign in with those things, you're giving them access to all your personal info attached to those accounts. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our next story is from NanaJ888. 
I gave someone the wrong answer on her test. Okay, this happens back when I was in high school, when I was 16 or 17. I'm now 23. I'm pretty good at English. I came from a country in Asia, so English isn't very common. So one time, me and Tina, my friend, we played with water. Tina sprayed me with water and accidentally sprayed someone else. Let's call her Thea. We apologized, but she decided to throw a racist comment and called us stupid Chinese in my native language. Fast forward, we're on our very last test before graduation. Thea sat behind me and kept calling me asking for an answer to the English tests. So being the petty person, I gave it to her, all the wrong answers. The test results came back, I got a 94 on my tests, and guess who got 60 on theirs? I don't blame OP one bit for doing what they did here. They made an accident, they accidentally sprayed water on Thea, and instead of just being the bigger person and accepting their apology for an honest mistake, they turn around and get racist and nasty, well, down the road, it's no surprise that OP's not going to just bail you out on your test after all that. This next story is from Beard Guitar 123 Neighbor called code enforcement on me about my lawn without even speaking directly with me first. Now I'm really gonna piss him off. A little background info, my wife and I purchased our house a few years ago, and the day we moved in, our neighbor Roger called the cops on us for moving in too loud. We weren't playing music, or even talking amongst ourselves, just my wife and I, moving our belongings into our new house. Cops came, I explained that I was just moving in, and they apologized for bothering us. Roger and all his retired proud boy glory comes out of his house immediately after they left to let us know that he's the one that called the cops, and in more words says he's setting the tone for our new life. Even still, we were super cordial with this guy because we wanted to make a good impression in our new neighborhood. It's our first home and it was important to us to make it homey. About a year or so later, our first son's born. We let our property fall to the back burner while we adjusted to parenthood, and a few newspapers piled up in our driveway and, in the rain, sort of melt onto our driveway. All on our property. Roger comes knocking on our door to complain. I tell him I'm sorry and that we let it get away from us. I explain that we have a newborn son and I would get to it ASAP. He digs in and starts telling me how when he was a new father he didn't let anything affect his property and he tells me I'm being lazy. I said, then why don't you pick it up if you're so worried about it? To which he says, no, I want you to pick up the freaking mess. I was trying to be semi-cordial still because I'm not interested in unnecessary conflict with my neighbor, so I told him, fine, I'll get to it and he left. Later that year, Roger comes over one day to ask if he can trim the tree that hangs over my fence onto his side of the fence, and I'm fine with that so I say no problem, and he casually mentions how one time when a 17 year old kid, friends with his delinquent drug addict son at the time, broke into his garage, he hit him in the head with a baseball bat until he was R word, and the police came and he was cleared of all responsibility because it was a break in. He's smiling and laughing while telling me this. Noted, I'm thinking to myself, this guy is a freaking piece of crap psychopath. Well, it's a couple years later now with a few more minor run-ins, but nothing too significant. And my wife and I just had our second son one month ago. About 10 days ago, son isn't even three weeks old at this time, I get a notice on my door saying my lawn is in violation of my city's code. I mowed it two days before my son was born, so it's been about three weeks since I mowed and it's been raining since. I have 48 hours to comply. I call the number on the card and no answer. So I call the non-emergency line to verify what my responsibility is because of the vague wording on the door hanger. It's because one of the grass types of my lawn, growing very sparsely like one blade per square inch, is over 12 inches tall. The majority of the grass was like 2-3 to inches long, but there was another type there as well that grew faster. I told them that I'm a new father and ask for an extension to deal with it later. They said don't even worry about the lawn, just take care of the baby. So now with some newfound confidence, I mow my lawn into a spiral shape leaving lots of grass remaining as a middle finger to whoever, we knew who it was at this point in the story right, called the cops on me about my lawn. A couple days later, Roger talks to me over our shared backyard fence, 
and asks about my lawnmower and if it's busted or something. I told him, no, I just have more important priorities than mowing my lawn, and tell him about my new son, and then I asked if he was the one that called the cops on me about it. He says he called code enforcement, but not on me. He called on my new neighbors on my other side, a really nice Mexican family who's always diligent about their lawn and always outside working on their new property. He says code enforcement must have happened to notice my lawn when they went to follow up on his call next door. At this point, I say something along the lines of, Look, I'm a pretty freaking cool guy. If you have a concern about my property, then you can speak with me directly. He swears up and down that he didn't call on me and that it was just a coincidence. Whatever. About a week after that, yesterday, he knocks on my door and I already know what's coming. I answer the door kind of chuckling and greet him. He's kind of chuckling too at this point because it's freaking ridiculous. He says, Hey, so you said I could talk to you if I had an issue with your property. I tell him, yeah, by all means. He gestures to my lawn and asks what it's about. I say, it's kind of like a middle finger to whoever called code enforcement on me. He is irate. Says if it's a middle finger to him. I stop him and remind him that he told me that he didn't call him on me, so he shouldn't feel targeted. He ignores me and restarts his sentence the same way again. So I cut him off again and I say, I specifically am telling you it's not a middle finger to you, Roger. He says, if it's a middle finger to me, then this means war. Over what? I ask him laughing. He's getting bigger and huffier by the second and tells me I'm a lazy piece of crap and my property's in shambles and that all the other neighbors mow their lawn. I remind him that I have a newborn son and that my lawn can suck my you know what for now. He puffs up as big as he can and says, I never had this issue when I was a new father. I told him I don't give a crap about what he did as a dad. Ironically enough, his drug addict son lives in the house on the other side of him and causes trouble in the neighborhood regularly. Cars peeling out, people screaming at each other, drug addicts always waiting outside, etc. Now he tells me that he's going to call code enforcement on me every day, and I tell him to get the freak off my property. He says, move me. So I tell him I'm calling the cops, and he says, do it. So I grab my phone and start dialing. He walks to the sidewalk and keeps yelling at me about how I'm lazy and not fit to own my property. Cops come and speak with us. Very anticlimactic. They didn't make sure to let him know that he needs to get off my property when I say so. And that's all I wanted from them. Tomorrow I'm going to take my hedge trimmers and mow my maze down to 11 inches. Screw you, Roger. All I know is it would suck to live next to a neighbor like this that doesn't let you get away with anything that's, you know, slightly out of code. Frankly, I'd say this is worse than just living in an HOA community. It definitely takes a certain kind of person to keep living next to a neighbor like that. Somebody that actually thrives on allowing the neighbor to get more and more upset. All I know is, is in this day and age with everything that's gone on, I don't know if I would feel greatly comfortable continuing to piss off this neighbor because first of all you heard what they said about what they did to the kid in the garage. Who knows one day if you can finally just get this guy to totally snap and he does something really serious. Our next story is from Revolutionary P833. Don't like me smoking weed? Okay. So a little backstory. I smoke weed to help deal with my mental health issues, but I found myself in a dilemma. Whenever I smoke in my room, the smell seeps through the door crack and makes the house smell. So I tried finding a nice scenic place, but when it's cold or raining, you kind of want to smoke in the comfort of your own house. I started smoking in my backyard only at nighttime because the neighbors to my right have kids and I want to be respectful. The other night, I was smoking outside and my neighbor to the left were outside talking. So I come out at the usual time and mind my own business. There's a six foot wall separating me and them, so I give them their space and I have mine. I come back inside and I have my window slightly ajar and I can hear them arguing about calling the police and saying, I don't want to smell that crap. Ten minutes later, the police knock on my door and ask to have a look around the house. Five minutes before I ran outside, found a fence and wedged all my weed stuff inside it. They have a look around and found nothing. I'm now seething. I'm in Ireland where weed is 100% illegal, so I could get into some serious trouble. We're grown adults. If you have a problem with me smoking weed, come and tell me which I'd appreciate more than you calling the police. Time for the revenge. 
Weed may be illegal in Ireland, but CBD bud isn't. You may be wondering, what is CBD bud? Simplified, it's basically CBD, but it looks and smells like weed. I rolled up a nice fat joint, stood right next to the wall separating me and them, and started smoking away. Four minutes later, the police knock on my door and immediately smell what seems to be weed. I kindly pointed out that it's CBD bud and completely legal as long as it contains less than 0.3% THC, the thing that gets you high. They agree and leave. The neighbors hate me because the police can't do anything. Moral of the story, please be an adult and communicate your feelings. Let's kind of put ourselves in the neighbor's shoes here. If you're outside talking late at night and your neighbor goes out into their backyard and starts smoking and you can kind of smell it creeping over the wall and let's say it's something that's bothering you or you don't personally like, would you yourself go over there and ask them to stop smoking outside if they can tell you're outside? Or do you think it is understandable for them to get upset about it and call the cops rather than go over there and try to talk it out with a neighbor? Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Our next story is from Big Mick Large Huge 7, parked my car in the street, got a removal notice. So we need to have the main water line into the house replaced. So they need to come out and mark all the utility lines before they dig for the new pipe. I moved my old car to the street in front of my house on Thursday. On Saturday, I had a removal notice from the city for an unattended vehicle in place for 48 hours. Keep in mind, the car is registered to my address and was parked in front of my house. Our neighbors across the street had to have called it in and that pisses me off. When they first moved in, they left a work truck in front of our house for a month, then another month shortly thereafter. Was I happy? No. Did I call the police? No. His work truck along with the other neighbor's vehicles are okay even having people visiting in a trailer or RV for two to three weeks at a time. So I moved the car back up into my driveway, but I did move the old toilet that's been sitting next to the house, waiting for bulk trash pickup. Didn't like looking at my old car? Enjoy looking at the toilet, jerk. When they come to trench, I plan on moving the car into the same spot, only in my yard. City can't remove it on your property. Enjoy looking at it. I was going to donate it to charity soon, but now I think I might keep it a bit longer. Those neighbors are total jerks. It would honestly piss me off to no end to realize that they did that. And frankly, I might want to be petty and do the same thing that OP did too, just leave it parked there right in the yard, make them look out their windows and study it for a good while, maybe even a month or two, and then finally donate it to a good cause. Our next story is from RetroFanSid6581, Revenge is a dish best served cold. About 20 years ago, I worked in a local computer shop. There was only a handful of staff and it was very much a friends and family run place. The boss had an acquaintance who would come visit him, let's call him Dave. He would be in the back area with all of us along with the stock, CPUs, RAM, hard drives, GPUs, etc. Because we were all friends, stock checking and keeping was very laps, but we trusted one another so it wasn't a problem. But suddenly things were going missing and we couldn't work out what was going on. We all suspected it was Dave, but couldn't be sure. Around that time, there was a very popular screensaver doing the rounds. It was a very photorealistic 3D aquarium screensaver by Jim Sachs, and everyone wanted it on their PC. I had it on my work PC, and when Dave saw it, he immediately asked for a copy, to which I refused. He grumbled about it and then left. I then had the idea of catching him out. I fired up Visual Basic and made a quick program called Aquarium Screensaver, and compiled it with a standard Windows type setup wizard. The setup looked very legit. I then saved it to a floppy, yes a floppy, and wrote aquarium screensaver on the disk. I then put it on the side and left it. The next day, when I got to work, the disk was missing. I asked the boss if Dave had been in, and he had. Now as you can imagine, I didn't write a screensaver. In fact, I wrote an app to delete all the files and folders on any computer that installed it. In the setup terms and conditions, it clearly explains that this is what would happen, and the user agrees to this before installing. Later that day, we get a call from Dave asking to speak to me. Dave asked if I had any problems with the screensaver, as his computer would no longer boot. I said no, it was fine for me, and to perhaps try it on his other computer. 
A few days later, one of the other staff told him I had made this program, and he stormed into our shop to face off with me, but soon backed off when I reminded him I hadn't given him the screensaver, so we proved he was happy to steal something, and we got petty revenge. It's honestly a darn smart way to catch a thief like that. If you know something as far as computers go that they really desire, you just happen to have an installer or a CD or a DVD lying around that contains that file supposedly, and it's no surprise that Sticky Fingers Dave is the one who took it. If the suspected thief wants something, so you go ahead and plant it, it would be no surprise if all of a sudden that suspected thief now suddenly has that exact thing they were asking about, and the one you planted was missing. Our next story is from IVA GM. Make me stay at work for an extra hour? I'll sleep through it. So this happened a while back, but I was retelling the story yesterday, and my friend called me petty. Obviously, I saw this as reasoning to post it here. I worked customer support from home at my last job. We didn't get paid overtime, because it's from home, or some other BS. One day, at the last 50 plus minutes of my shift, my connection dropped for long enough to kick me out of the VPN the company uses. I could not connect again to that VPN due to a technical issue, but I still had internet. I reported this to my boss so that she would let me go for the day and I could just stay for an hour more the next one. My boss instructed me to stay because I was logged into the systems and could help out in other areas that was not talking to the clients. She told me that despite me staying till the end of my shift and helping out, I would still have to do overtime the next day because my task for the day was to contact customers, not help out in other areas. I couldn't work my task, but I was forced to stay and work on other tasks, and on top of that I would have to work overtime another day? Basically, I wouldn't get paid for the hour I did work because it wasn't logged, nor for the other hour because it was logged as overtime which was unpaid. No thank you, cue my petty revenge slash malicious compliance. I finished off my shift that day at a bit later than 5pm, however my boss reported officially that I'd worked until 4pm due to a technical issue, and logged an hour of overtime for me for another shift. What she didn't realize was that the other shift had a different task, not contact customers but do internal work on tickets and such. This work isn't heavily monitored by the minute as the one with the customers. So the morning of my overtime shift, I logged into the system and fell blissfully back asleep for an hour. My productivity for the day went significantly down as they track that, but I was logged and working on some really tough internal cases. No one could say anything. I was one of their best workers, the only one on my team that was fast and competent whose productivity was great. Heck, they promoted me because of it, with a 4% raise in salary, which is an absolute joke here, as average is 15-25%, to so they lost more money by trying to cheat me out of two working hours, to be honest, and they lost my respect, as I ended up quitting a month later. Frankly, that's one of those jobs that you do work at for a while, but you realize... The amount of work and dedication you put into that job will never be respected by the people actually overseeing that job, both in just how they treat you as a human and also compensation. Just because you're working from home doesn't mean it's not overtime. And our final story of the day is from Fan Commercial 1802. My college roommates needed to chill. Quick background, my final year at university I got divorced and ended up rooming with a bunch of random younger dudes I'd never met. At the time, I was working at a nighttime maintenance job on campus. Think basic electrician and plumbing work. My roommates were all quite religious. Not a problem, I also am in my own way. But not attending their church was a real sticking point they couldn't get over. It led to many heated and boring discussions. So in petty revenge, every morning when I had the apartment to myself, they all had morning classes, I'd go into someone's room and unwire an outlet one by a desk or wherever their phone or laptop charger was. I capped everything off, it was safe and up to code. I didn't need an arson charge. Naturally, they'd complain to the apartment complex. We'd get a notice that maintenance would be entering on such and such date and time. I'd go back in and connect everything back up before the maintenance guy came. Eventually, the complex staff decided that our apartment was just full of it, so they took longer and longer to respond. So my final parting gift was to turn off the natural gas to the water heater for finals week. 
Nothing like an ice-cold shower before exams. To be fair, I bet an ice-cold shower before exams would actually be pretty decent. Like, I'm imagining you want to feel woken up and kind of engaged, and like, yeah, it's jarring, but you're pretty awake after an ice-cold shower. Everything else, though, is really smooth. I got my evil fast food boss fired. The summer before my freshman year of college, I worked at a local franchise of a fast food chain that's pretty popular here in the US. I won't say the name of the chain because I'd hate to tarnish their precious reputation or somehow face legal action all these years later, but let's just say they're well known for their delicious chicken sandwiches and their ownership's unfriendliness towards the LGBT community. Anyway, this was the first real job I'd ever held. I'd done random stuff here and there over the years, yard work for neighbors, refing basketball games, dog sitting, but nothing ever amounting to an actual position. You know, something with wages and a uniform and all that good stuff. At the start of the summer, I was actually excited for the job though. Working at a fast food restaurant wasn't exactly the most glamorous thing in the world, sure, but I knew I'd at least be making money, something my teenage self had a definite lack of. And I also knew several of my school friends had worked at the same franchise before. They never complained to me about work, so how bad could it really be? I also had a really pleasant interview to get the job. The man who had conducted it had been a nice older gentleman, graying hair, roundish face, soft smile, who had kindly reassured me that the work wasn't too bad and that I would quickly receive a raise in my hourly wage once I completed their mandatory training. At the time, I'd assumed he was going to be my boss and that it was going to be his calm presence and kind demeanor running the work environment. Boy, how nice that would have been. Anyway, on my first day of work, I walked into the restaurant and made my way into the back kitchen area where I was supposed to be working that summer. Not seeing Mr. Carlson, the man for my interview, I approached a kitchen worker who was putting together sandwiches. Uh, excuse me, I said. Is Mr. Carlson here? It's my first day and I'm... Mr. Carlson, the guy interrupted. Mr. Carlson's not here right now, I don't think. He doesn't really come in that often, just for special occasions, prospective employee interviews, that kind of stuff. But isn't he the manager, I asked? How can he not come in that often? The guy looked at me confused. Mr. Carlson's not the manager, he's the franchise owner. She, he said, nodding towards a middle-aged woman, is the manager. I looked over at the lady he had pointed out. She was short thin and seemed to have a permanent frown carved onto her face. It looked like she was chewing someone out at the other end of the kitchen. As I was studying her, she suddenly turned around, locked eyes with me and began making her way over to where I was standing. The guy I had been talking with noticed her walking over too and quickly went back to his sandwiches. Nice to meet you man but I've got to get back to work. The name's Nate though. He paused for a second and then looked back at me. Good luck. Before I had the chance to ask him what sort of luck I would need frying nuggets and putting together sandwiches, suddenly the manager had made it across the kitchen and was right at my side. You're late, she said to me, emphasizing the last word like it was a crime on par with murder. Not really a great first impression to make with your new boss, is it? Late, I asked, genuinely confused. I thought my shift was supposed to start at 12.30, and it's 12.33, she said, like that somehow she cleared the confusion up, not one minute late, not two minutes late, but three entire minutes late. Was she serious right now? I say, well, I got here at 12.30, I just wasn't sure where to go, and I was looking for, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, nope, nope, she said, interrupting me like a preschool teacher. That's not what we're going to do right now. Make excuses like that. That's the kind of stuff that's going to get you sent right out that door, she said, pointing to the exit. When I tell you you messed up, all I want to hear is, I'm sorry, Miss Connie. It won't happen again. Understand? I gave Miss Connie the most professional nod I could muster in that moment, but she made a sort of motion with her hand like she was waiting for more. After a few seconds, I got it. I'm sorry, Miss Connie, I said with gritted teeth. It won't happen again. She nodded smugly to herself, apparently satisfied with my apology, then turned around and told me to follow her and make it quick. You've got a lot of work to catch up on. After that, the rest of my eight hour shift went about as well as my first conversation with Miss Connie had gone. There was genuinely a lot of stuff to pick up on about working in the kitchen. For one thing, how to properly put on a hairnet, how to work the deep frying machines, 
how to operate the industrial dishwasher, how to determine if the pickle slices were too big or too small, how long to keep the sandwich buns in the toaster for. The list of insanely specific instructions seemed to grow bigger and bigger as the day went on, and I struggled to keep it all fresh in my head. But that was nothing compared to the nightmare that was Miss Connie. I don't even know how to explain it, other than to say that I basically experienced that first interaction I had with her for the entire day, on repeat, for eight hours. There was just no relief from her presence. At the frying station, at the dishwasher, at the sandwich counter, there she was, breathing down my neck, watching me like a hawk, criticizing my every move. When I finally got on a 15 minute break five hours into my shift, I half expected her to follow me into the restroom and critique the way I stood at the urinal. You're probably assuming that from this description that Miss Connie was at least the one leading me around the kitchen and, you know, showing me how everything was supposed to be done. But nope. That job went to my main man Nate from earlier. After Miss Connie had barked at him to get over here and show this idiot how we do things. Miss Connie's job, in reality, seemed to just consist of standing right beside me, scowling and interrupting whatever I was attempting to do with some sort of insanely specific, always unhelpful comment every five seconds. I kid you not when I say I didn't get through a single task that day without having to endure some sort of infuriating little nitpick. As I was taking a container of nuggets out of a deep fryer, You're not holding that handle tightly enough. Are you trying to kill us all with boiling oil? I had both hands on the handle and about as secure a grip as humanly possible as I was putting pickle slices on sandwich buns. That slice right there is not even close to the right size. I said around the size of a nickel, not the size of a penny. Are you even listening to me? I looked it up later. The size difference between a penny and a nickel is, wait for it, two millimeters. Two millimeters. As I was scrubbing dishes in the back after the restaurant had closed, I can't believe I seriously have to tell you this. Scrub the pan clockwise, not counterclockwise. I shouldn't have to be the one holding your hand through every little thing you do. I'm not even going to comment on this one. Needless to say, by the end of my 8-hour shift that day, I was beyond done with Miss Connie. Ready to quit, ready to leave and never return. Ready to find a new job. Ready, honestly, to do anything else that didn't involve being paid a minimum wage to spend eight hours in a hot, loud kitchen with the most frustrating boss imaginable. Somehow, though, with every sign pointing at me to find something better, I decided to stay. I only had two and a half months before summer was over. I reasoned to myself, I could stick it out for that long. And besides, it couldn't possibly get any worse than it had been on the first day, right? Right? narrator voice he was not right it could in fact get worse much much worse as i would learn quite well through my time working with her that summer miss connie was not just rude or frustrating or overly zealous about clockwise dish scrubbing no that was just the surface level stuff the kind of stuff you'd pick up on from one day working with her the real miss connie had a whole laundry list of nasty traits some of which exposed her as being just a generally horrible person, but all of which exposed her as being a truly incompetent, insufferable boss to work for. Let's run through a few of them so you can hopefully see what I mean. Nasty trait number one, laziness. There's no beating around the bush on this one. Miss Connie was just downright lazy. I'd already gotten a glimpse of this side from her for my first day. You know, when she got Nate to show me how to do everything and spoke up only when she wanted to criticize something I was doing. But this experience was actually a little misleading. Why? Well, it turned out Miss Connie regularly did even less than she had done on that first day. A typical work day for her would involve sitting on a folding chair she would keep in the center of the kitchen, flipping through some magazine or newspaper or scrolling through her phone and then periodically looking up from her reading material to scream at someone about how they were doing something all wrong. The only reason she would get up from her chair would be to use the restroom, or more often, to chew someone out if they felt they deserved more than a regular sitting down reprimand. The worst part about it is that we, the regular workers I mean, were never allowed to sit down, not even for a second, and we were working minimum 8 hour shifts. If you've ever been on your feet for more than four, five hours at a time, 
then you know what I'm talking about when I say that towards the end of those shifts, our legs and feet were burning. But if Miss Connie ever caught one of us even leaning against the counter to try to reduce some of that pain, she was out of her precious chair in an instant, yelling and screaming about how unprofessional and lazy we were. I don't think she really had a grasp on the concept of irony. Nasty trait number two, incompetence. Others might say idiocy. You would think someone with the gall to sit in a folding chair all day, barking orders and screaming about the right way to do something, would at least know what they're talking about, right? You know, on a basic, this is how the machine works kind of level? Well, think again, because Miss Connie knew nothing about how the kitchen operated. I remember one time in particular when the consequences of her incompetence were really put on full display. It was a Sunday afternoon, around lunchtime, so we were at our absolute peak hours of busyness. Frankly, we were always busy. Monday, Saturday, lunchtime, dinner time. It didn't matter. People were coming in droves. For whatever reason though, this particular Saturday was even busier than usual. The drive through line was wrapped two times around the building. The inside dining area was filled to the brim with people waiting to order, and the kitchen, well, the kitchen was struggling. On this particular day, I had the great luck of being the one operating the deep frying machines. This meant in essence that the entire kitchen's rate of output was dependent on how fast I could operate the fryers and push out fresh chicken. I was frying as fast as I possibly could, putting down basket after basket of nuggets and fillets, but we were still drowning in orders. There was just no way to keep up with the sheer number of people at the restaurant. After about 15 minutes of trying to remedy the situation from the comfort of her folding chair, Miss Connie suddenly decided that enough was enough and that she needed to help by getting in my ear and yelling at me. You need to make the fryers go faster, she screamed. This is unacceptable. Now, I had to simultaneously keep the fryers going and keep up a conversation with my crazy boss. They're going as fast as they possibly can, Miss Connie, I try to explain. I've got all of them running at max temperature. Max temperature? I know they can do more than that. I've done it myself. Set this next batch to a higher setting. If I put it to a higher setting, the fryer could break or the stop arguing and do it. I knew there was no reasoning with her, so I reluctantly set a new basket of nuggets into the oil and clicked the fryer into a higher setting. Something that Nate had specifically told me never to do. After about 30 seconds, the fryer started making a whining sound like it was being strained too hard. Miss Connie, I don't think this is good for the fryer, I said. I need to put it back down to its normal setting or it might quit with the back talk and just cook. I think I would know better than you anyway. Sure enough though, after another 30 seconds, the fryer suddenly made a loud pop noise and all the lights on its exterior turned off. I held the power button down, desperately trying to reset it, but it was useless. The fryer was down and we still had nearly a hundred orders to fill. Miss Connie was obviously furious at me. I'm not sure what you did to cause this, but you are in deep trouble. You better hope that fryer doesn't need to be replaced or it's coming out of your paycheck. Fortunately for me and my paycheck, the fryer wasn't permanently broken and didn't have to be replaced altogether. It was, however, completely non-functional for the rest of the day, causing our order backlog that afternoon to become even worse and Miss Connie to become even more insufferable as we struggled to keep up with demand. But wait, there's more. Nasty trait number three, racism. Yes, you heard that right. On top of everything else, the laziness, the rudeness, the incompetence, Miss Connie was also horribly racist. At first, it was just a couple of questionable statements here and there, stuff about how certain customers, who always happen to be minorities, were making her feel unsafe or about how a black teenager playing rap music in the drive through line was probably in a gang. But then it started to get even more obvious, to the point that there was no way she could deny it. Sometimes she would be sitting on her folding chair, flipping through a magazine or scrolling through her phone, and she would suddenly look up and, talking to no one in particular, say something blatantly offensive like, This country was so much better off before we started caving into black people's demands, or I just wish I could snap my fingers and get us back to how it was in the 50s. Yeah, luckily no one working in the kitchen was a minority, 
In hindsight, I'm not so sure that was a coincidence. So there was no one she could outright target with that sort of stuff, but it was still extremely uncomfortable to have to listen to her crazed ranting and raving. Anyway, all that to say, working with Miss Connie was a nightmare and truly one of the worst experiences of my life. By the end of summer, I was frustrated and burnt out and done with anything and everything kitchen, chicken, and deep fryer related. The one thing I wanted was to get away from Miss Connie as quickly as possible and without so much as a goodbye. Until that is, the opportunity to give Miss Connie a proper fitting goodbye presented itself. The kind of goodbye that only someone as horrible as Miss Connie deserves, revenge. I hadn't been planning on trying to get any sort of payback before I left. Like I said, by the end of the summer, I was just ready to get as far away from Miss Connie as humanly possible. But one night, as Nate and I were talking in the parking lot after another horrible shift, a plan started to come together. The conversation started out like any other. Well, that was fun, I said sarcastically. I almost wish the restaurant stayed open later so I could work another eight-hour shift. Nate laughed and said, Yeah, right, I think I'd literally rather walk on broken glass than spend another eight hours in that dungeon. I laughed back. Come to think of it, I probably would too. I paused for a second. We'd almost reached our cars. You know, Nate, as terrible as this summer's been, I'm glad I was able to meet you. I'm almost sorry to have to leave and strand you here all alone with Miss Crazy. Wait a second, Nate said. You're leaving too? Two? I looked at him confused. Does that mean you're leaving soon as well? He said, uh, yeah, man. I'm getting the heck out of here. I've already wasted two years at this stupid place. Surely I can find something better than this. He paused. Friday's my last day, and after that, I'm gone. Dang, I said. Friday's my last day too. I guess that's just gonna leave Mark and Brandon here. Mark and Brandon were the two other kitchen workers. Guess so, he said. Although you know, Brandon has been talking about quitting this job so he can do school full time. But if Brandon quits, that would just leave... I looked over at Nate to see if he was thinking the same thing I was. He nodded. That would just leave one person here, he laughed. And imagine if Mark left too. It would literally just be Miss Connie in the kitchen. She would be screwed. That's when it came to me. Wait, I said. You know how Friday's supposed to be super busy because of that basketball tournament? Well, I continued. What if instead of quitting after Friday, we quit before Friday? And we convince Mark and Brandon to quit too. Miss Connie would be by herself in the kitchen, trying to keep up with the orders on maybe the busiest day we've had this summer. Nate looked at me smiling and said, I think that might be the best plan I've ever heard. After that conversation in the parking lot, all that was left to do was to convince Mark and Brandon to join in on our plan. Brandon had been planning to quit for some time, so he agreed to the plan almost as soon as we proposed it to him. Mark was a little bit harder to convince, but he came around too once we framed it in terms of finally getting some revenge on Miss Connie. So the plan was set. After our Thursday shift was over and Miss Connie had left the restaurant, she naturally was always the first one to leave, we would leave all our uniforms in the kitchen along with a written note explaining why we had decided to leave. I took on the responsibility of drafting the note and went into super lengthy detail about everything wrong with Miss Connie. From her ignorance of how the kitchen worked to her frequent racist comments, I figured Miss Connie would probably find the note and tear it up, but why not at least try to get her in trouble? When Thursday finally rolled around, everything went exactly as we had planned. We endured Miss Connie's normal abuse, got through our final shift, and then, as soon as Miss Connie had raced out of the parking lot, left our uniforms and the note I'd written together in the kitchen. That left just one thing. Enjoy the chaos that was sure to be breaking out soon. The next day, rather than idly sit by and imagine everything that was going down at the restaurant, the four of us decided to go at lunchtime and check it out with our own eyes. And boy, were we in for a treat. As soon as we stepped through those doors, we could tell that our plan had to be working. For one thing, the line to order food literally stretched from the front counter to just a few feet in front of the doors that we'd just walked through. In two and a half months that I'd worked there, I had never seen a line that long. Even on the day Miss Connie had caused the fryer malfunction, 
That meant something, or someone, had to be holding up the food in the kitchen. More interested in revenge than ordering a chicken sandwich, the four of us walked past the line up to the counter, where you can see the front part of the kitchen through a little opening in the dividing barrier. That's when we saw the sweet, sweet fruit of our delicious plan for revenge. For maybe the first time in her entire career, Miss Connie was out of her folding chair and running back and forth across the kitchen with the most frantic, worried expression I've ever seen on someone's face. It looked like Miss Connie had gotten one or two of the employees who usually worked out front to help her in the kitchen, but I knew their help would be basically useless since Miss Connie hardly had any idea how to work the deep fryers. Sure enough, around 30 seconds after we'd started watching her, I could sort of make out the sound of Miss Connie screaming something to one of the employees about, I don't know, just figure it out. As soon as we heard her yelling, the four of us began to crack up. Nate turned to me and said, You know, I'd be impressed if she's even managed to turn one of the fryers on. I laughed and said, Bet you a million dollars she's running them on too high of a setting right now. After a couple of minutes of enjoying Miss Connie frantically trying to run the kitchen from afar, I decided I deserved a closer look. Wait here, I told Nate. I walked past the front counter, explaining to one of the employees that I left something here yesterday that I need to pick up real quick, and then made my way into the kitchen. Miss Connie spotted me almost as soon as I stepped through the door, running up to me with a look of pure hatred on her face. You idiot, she screamed. You were supposed to be here three hours ago. Where in God's name have you been? Did you not get the note we left? I asked. It should have explained everything. Note? What note? She yelled. You know what? Never mind. It doesn't matter. Just put on some gloves and help me with these fryers. We're swamped right now. No can do, I said, as I began to head back towards the exit. I was actually just about to be on my way. On your way? On your way? If you step out that door, you are fired. I mean, done here. No need for any of that, I said as I opened the door. I quit. As I closed the kitchen door behind me, I could hear the muffled sound of Miss Connie's yelling. After that, the four of us decided to leave, having seen what we had come to the restaurant to see, plus a little more. In the parking lot, we have a sort of impromptu victory celebration, letting out a few celebratory cheers and sharing a couple F you Miss Connie high fives. Then we all said our goodbyes, shook hands, and drove away in our respective cars. The job was done, victory had been won. I thought that was going to be the end of the situation, but a week after that Friday, Nate called me out of the blue. Dude, he said when I picked up the phone. Did you hear about what happened to Miss Connie after we left? I told him I hadn't, so he proceeded to fill me in, and man was it good. Apparently at some point after we'd left the restaurant that day, Mr. Carlson, the franchise owner, had showed up. Presumably after being told there was some sort of problem with the kitchen staff and ridiculously long lines for food. When he got there, he obviously went straight to the kitchen to see what the problem was only to find Miss Connie, along with two employees who didn't work in the kitchen, attempting to operate frying machines that none of the three knew how to use at all. As if that wasn't bad enough for Miss Connie, Mr. Carlson then found the uniforms and the note we had left there the night before. Apparently in all of her frantic running around and trying to operate the fryers, Miss Connie had never paused long enough to see the note and to get it before someone else. Having read the note, Mr. Carlson then obviously proceeded to fire Miss Connie, which he could do without severance pay because of the details I'd graciously provided in our little farewell letter. When Nate told me that part, I couldn't help but laugh. Sounds like we really got the best of Miss Crazy then. He agreed, and apparently after Mr. Carlson fired her, Miss Connie just started to go absolutely ballistic too like screaming at everyone, cursing up a storm, yelling about lawsuit this and lawsuit that. Someone who was working at the front counter said people could hear her all the way in the dining area. I laughed. Now that was the Miss Connie I had had the distinct displeasure of getting to know that summer. After that, I never did hear anything else about what happened to Miss Connie. If I had to guess, I would say that she's probably back to incompetently managing fast food franchises and terrorizing poor teenage employees trying to make a buck over the summer. That was always the one thing she was any good at. If there was one thing that would just tickle me pink about Miss Connie after this story, 
It would be if any potential future employer were to get in contact with the franchise owner of the original place and was able to first hand over the phone and get those details about, you know, all the blatant things Miss Connie's done. Suffice to say, I feel like Miss Connie should be outlawed from ever being able to be in a managerial position. Do you guys think upon finding out everything about Miss Connie here, that the franchise owner should go out of their way to alert any restaurant in the area about Miss Connie and what Miss Connie did? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Try to rip me off? Let's get your mother-in-law involved. Booked a local guy to install new doors in my house during lockdown. I was staying at my sister's. Thought I was doing him a favor as no one wanted people in their house, so he was lacking work. Well, he puts the doors in but doesn't trim them to fit. So I couldn't close any doors, including the hallway and bathroom door, without them scraping and damaging the floor. He said he would do that the next week. Four times he arranged to come back, then didn't show. Eventually, I just asked for half my money back, as he did technically supply the doors. He promised, then delayed, delayed, delayed. Threatening court action got me nowhere. Writing a negative review got me nowhere. Months go by. So my friend and I did some Sherlock Holmes sleuthing, and my friend worked out we knew his mother-in-law. She was a teacher at our old high school. One text was all it took. Sorry we couldn't resolve this, but small world, I know your mother-in-law. She was my favorite teacher in school. I really should catch up with her. Money was hand-delivered through my mailbox within 20 minutes. And yeah, I mentioned it to his mother-in-law anyway. He's divorced now. Probably not my doing, but still funny. Do you almost feel bad for the guy that they were that scared of being ripped into by their own mother-in-law that they would be willing to go and fork up that cash? Or do you think, considering the quality of work he did, it wasn't even enough revenge? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is from Lesbian Linguist. Won't pay me back? I'll just embarrass you. Another story on here reminded me of something I did back in 2016. So, I joined the Navy in 2016. During boot camp, we have these photo packages offered to us that are super expensive. You can get your boot camp pictures, a light up crystal engraving, etc. They had initially made us send all of our belongings back home in a box. But they told us to keep a couple of things, such as our credit and debit cards. One of the girls I'd befriended forgot to keep her card with her. So she didn't have a way to pay for her picture package, which came out to be about $200. I told her I'd spot her, and I wrote down her info to contact her after boot camp. Obviously, a lot of us added each other on all forms of social media, so I had her on Facebook. I sent her a couple of messages to remind her that she owed me that money, and she said that she was a bit broke, so she'd get back to me. So I waited. Sent another message, no reply. Another, no reply. She didn't even have the brain cells to delete me off Facebook before posting pics with her friends of her expensive shopping trips. So here's the revenge. I went through her info on Facebook, found her mom, found her mom's number on white pages, and gave her a call. Hi, Mrs. Mother of Cheapskate. This is OP. I went to boot camp with your daughter. I actually lent her money for the picture package. She said she was too broke, yet going on shopping trips constantly, and she's now ignoring my messages on Facebook. So I thought I might give you a call and see if you can get her to respond. She hasn't paid you back? Interesting. Very interesting. What's your address? About a week later, I received a very nice handwritten note from Cheapskate with more than she owed me. I guess telling mommy really got to her. I think OP got the good ending in this scenario. I feel like a lot of people, if they're the kind of people that can afford going on rich shopping sprees and stuff like that, and also somebody like this who's going to try to stiff you and get away with it, you tend to believe that that kind of thing is a passed down behavior. And it wouldn't surprise me that in a million other similar scenarios, a mom would be like, stuck up, snooty, deflecting, saying they're not responsible for anything, telling you to go bite it, stuff like that. So the fact that this worked out so well for OP is actually pretty awesome. Our next story is from Sunset Bro 78 Don't park in my space. This happened a few years ago when I was living in Burbank, California. For a variety of reasons, I couldn't park in my space, and instead parked on the street, which was in a good area. Parking was allowed at all times for residents of Burbank only. The spot right in front of my house was always available, but it was under a tree full of birds, and your car would be covered in turds even after a few hours. 
Naturally, I didn't want to park there and would instead leave my car in front of the house two doors down, the nearest place with no tree. One day, this nudie owner meets me as I'm getting into my car. He wants me to keep clear of their space. I explain that public space is not theirs. He then threatened to do something to my car. The police went over there after I called them and found they were using the house for their business of renting camera equipment. That was against the law and they had to cease operations immediately and get the freak out of Burbank within a month. Further, everyone there was parking on the street and as non-residents of the city, they were in violation and all received tickets as well. Every action carries a consequence that you probably did not anticipate, Mr. Neighbor. It was a most satisfying week. Honestly, I don't blame OP if they're parking in a spot that makes sense for them and they have every right to do so. People might say that it's bad etiquette to park in front of somebody else's house and take that space, but it is public property and nobody can dictate where you can and can't park on that street. So for them to come up to you, confront you, and then basically make an ambiguous threat as to what they're going to do to your car, calling the authorities and at least trying to build up that report is a pretty good idea. Because if something does happen, that's going to be on record that you called them in and reported that. And this business bust was just the icing on the top. Our next story is from Mergadoro. Here's a leaking pen for you. Eons ago in the third grade, one classmate brought a box of 12 blue ballpoint pens. They were all the rave as they wrote very smoothly. Eleven friends of generous classmate got one pen each. I wasn't one of them, but I had the same pen. But never ever drop them, because the tip would start leaking. The trick is to wipe off the excess ink with a piece of paper and then use it. If writing for long minutes, periodically wipe off the tip of the paper. To store the pen, wrap it in paper before putting on the cap, and then put it in our pencil cases. One of the 11 recipients of the magic pen is Nasty Nasty Andrew. We fought each other all the time for every reason under the sun. Hey, we were eight. So in our school rooms in my country, the bench and desk are attached to each other. Each bench seats two people, the bench has a backrest. The backrest extends into the table for the people behind you, and so on. One day, Andrew was handing a book to my friend Joan behind him to be passed on to the end of the row. But Joan was busy writing something and didn't see the thing. Andrew bopped Joan on the head with the heavy book, which caused her pen to slide on the whole paper, rendering her assignment unsubmittable. I got mad too because we were eight. Her enemy is my enemy. The revenge... I stole the paper and cap for the amazing pen and put the pen tip down inside his bag. The pen leaked all over inside the bag and messed up his notebooks. Hmm, petty on hindsight, but for eight year old me it was pro revenge. Honestly for me, looking back to a time like third grade, this story serves as like a perfect example of the things the class would get obsessed about or use as like a status figure when in reality it's just having a pen like for no describable reason everybody in the classroom just starts like losing their mind at how amazing these pens are and how cool you are if you have one and it's like down the road you realize it was just a pen why was everybody so obsessed over it why was that your third grade reputation piece our next story is from ricky cory beat my full grown butt dad's workout short and sweet I'm 5'2", 24, female, and my dad's 5'8". My brother was teaching him certain muscle building workouts so dad can lift his muscles properly. My brother was teaching him how to do Bulgarian squats and wanted to use me as an example to show dad how it's done. Dad saw me lift 25 pound dumbbells each and started laughing. It says that I can't properly do it doing 50 pounds in total and will probably angle it wrong. Well suck it dad, I did it properly. As I should and my brother was very impressed with me. Dad made a surprised Pikachu face and was like, whatever, I do more weights than you, 35 pounds each, to which I pointed out, sure, but you're not doing a 90 degree proper way like mine, to which he didn't respond back. Honestly, it's greatly disappointing to me that this dad felt it necessary to make this into some like one-up competition. It sounds to me like there was some kind of insecurity about I don't know, not being able to outlift your own daughter. It's one thing to make a competition out of it, it's another to be insecure and make it like a a one-up contest. By the way, if you're enjoying these videos, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. 
Every single video has awesome stories, like our next story from Reddit admin dumb 87 You should always pay your accountant, especially if you've got skeletons in your closet. My buddy's an accountant, he has his own firm. His biggest clients are small to medium sized businesses. Well, he had a client who owned four different clubs and bars in two different cities. Client was always shady, always slow on payment, etc. I was also a customer of one of the bars. They had a poker game that I would play in on Thursdays. Well, one day I'm at my buddy's house having a few beers and he's complaining about non-payment from a client. I ask who, but he doesn't want to say. But it's really bugging him because it's a significant chunk of change. He then says the name, we'll call him Scott. I'm like, wow, Scott isn't paying you? He then says Scott is saying business is way down. And I think that's odd. I've been going to one Scott place and every Thursday it's packed. My buddy looks at me and goes, really? I go, yeah, he does this new cash discount thing. 15% off your tab if you pay cash. My buddy goes, really? I tell him about my experience at Scott's bar and eventually the topic changes. A few weeks later, my buddy calls me up and says, you going to Scott's bar to play poker? I said, yeah. He says, can I join? I go, sure. He joins, we get a few drinks in us, lose our money at poker. My house is closer and he decides to crash there. On the way over, he breaks down his theory. He thinks Scott is vastly underreporting his revenue. The reason why he suspects Scott is offering cash discounts is because cash is easier to hide. He says he's going to do a deep dive on Scott's finances. My friend tells me his plan is to go to all four of Scott's establishments, get the prices he charges at each place, piece together how much alcohol he's buying versus how much Scott is saying his revenue equates to, looks up how much Scott's paying in payroll, rent, bills, etc. Keep in mind, he has access to all this info, and he determines that Scott is basically using his credit card receipts, plus a little bit of cash, to cover his cost of business to include rent, payroll, insurance, liquor, food, etc. However, based upon the amount of products he's selling, he's suspecting Scott's underreporting his total income by about 35-40%. to 40%. He goes back into Scott's books even more, and he figures in the last year, Scott's been underreporting his sales by 35-40%, to 40%, but he's also been underreporting his sales by at least 20-25% to 25% for years on end. Simply put, there is no way Scott is going through as much product and as much alcohol as he's purchasing and having the revenue numbers that he's claiming. He's underreporting his sales to his accountant, which means he's also underreporting his earnings to the IRS. By this point, Scott owes my friend thousands of dollars that he hasn't paid. He said his total amount owed could buy a brand new motorcycle. He never gave me an exact number. My friend decides screw getting repayment from Scott. Let's get repayment from the IRS through the whistleblower program. He's estimating Scott's underreported his revenue by millions of dollars over the course of years. The whistleblower fees he'd earned from the IRS far outweigh the amount Scott owes him. The IRS will pay between 15 to 30 percent of what they collect. So with the assistance of a lawyer, my friend gathers all the evidence he has Scott's underreporting of to the IRS and files a whistleblower report with them. During this time, my friend fires Scott as a client for non-payment. Now, this part gets boring because there's a lot of legal wrangling and back and forth. This went back and forth. However, eventually the IRS comes down on Scott, and they come down hard. It's estimated that Scott underreported his income to the IRS by about $4.5 million. Now, my friend never told me how much the IRS was able to recoup, but Scott's businesses are no longer his businesses, and $4.5 million would put the whistleblower reward at around $675,000 to $1.3 million. Keep in mind, it's based on what the IRS collects, not the amount that's reported. I've asked my friend how much he got in the end, and he simply says, I no longer have a mortgage, and it would have been much cheaper for Scott to just pay me. Yeah, I mean, this story is a good example as any that if you're going to try to cheat the system like that, just know it takes one slip up to get caught, one person that witnesses everything that's going on and just doesn't have an interest in protecting you in any way. And not only do you stand to lose all of it, you probably stand to lose a lot more too. 
Because of that $4.5 million that Scott did not report, I would be willing to bet that they didn't have nearly that much saved up or in assets. This next story is from Memphis Grit. Maintenance guy at Senior Living Center gets revenge on satellite TV companies. Over 200 plus residents emerge victorious. I'm the maintenance director at an independent senior living center. It's pretty much an apartment complex in which you have to be a senior citizen to reside. We provide three meals a day, housekeeping, activities, a bus for transportation, and several other amenities to increase the quality of life because, more times than not, they'll spend the final years of their lives here. Our facility is family owned and orientated. Family members of current employees are encouraged to apply for positions. We have one rule in our employee handbook, ensure resident safety, happiness, and prolongment of life. I take my job very seriously and take pride in it. I try to go above and beyond and make them all happy. Each resident during the daytime either listens to the radio, plays crossword puzzles, or most of the time watch their favorite TV shows. We don't provide television service, each resident has to provide it themselves if they choose. Over the last year, there's been a trend of televisions not working in countless units and when this happens, they're very upset. When I get a work order for a TV, I go and check it out. Most of the time, there's nothing I can do. If the cable isn't cut, everything's plugged in, and there's no obstruction to the satellite signal, it's going to be a software issue. When this happens, I install an air antenna until the regular service is fixed. I call the company and a tech comes out, fixes it, and usually within a couple of hours, it stops working again. This is a never-ending cycle of upset residents. Over the course of an entire year, I spoke with several supervisors and tried to schedule for someone to come out and go through the entire property with me to address each issue. They weren't having that. They wanted me to go to each individual unit and have that particular resident call them. This is almost impossible. A lot of them have trouble hearing and discussing complex matters over the telephone, let alone know the four-digit code and the answer to the secret question. One resident was out of service for over 60 days, and I demanded that they refund or discount this particular resident properly. They ended up giving her $21 off, which isn't even half of a single month's payment. When I spoke with this particular representative, I told them that wasn't enough, and I would be throwing all of their dishes in the dumpster. This is just the tip of the iceberg. These companies have caused significant property damage to the facility. They've ran the coax in the gutters and down the downspouts, ran cables draped over the sidewalk, which is a tripping hazard, installed dishes in the center of courtyards and wherever it's convenient for them. All over the property, cables are strung out on top of the grass for hundreds of feet. They don't bother to bury any cables. I've discussed this numerous times with the owners of the facility the last year. The last time I spoke with him about it, he gave me the okay to handle the situation and do whatever needed to be done to fix the issue. My options were limited and the only feasible option I could concoct was using a landline company that didn't need a satellite dish. Well, I've officially finished running new coax to every single unit and a landline company came in and installed boxes and services in each resident's apartment. Residents who have previously had to pay a monthly fee for their television service now get their service free of charge. Those that never had service now do. We've saved over 50 residents money every month. And all in total, over 200 plus now have the television service that is included in their rent without any increase whatsoever. This was revenge for the representative talking to Miss T in such a negative and rude tone. I couldn't be happier for my residents. Honestly, bless OP for looking out for these people who, sadly in a lot of cases, do get mistreated. You always hear horror stories about how elder homes or senior care living situations, all these people get basically abused, minimal human contact, almost abandoned. So it's a godsend to hear a story where OP is a person out there just looking out for these people, improving the quality of their lives in their twilight years, and even saving them some money doing so. As far as I'm concerned, OP is a saint. And our final story of the day is from Inspector 5529 Deny my employee claim and tell me if I don't like it, I can leave? I'll withdraw everything from your company and watch you disintegrate. I have a story that started before the COVID pandemic and just concluded a while back. 
I'm a typical simple guy who just likes relaxing and was born with the proverbial silver spoon in my mouth. I'm the black sheep of my family and a middle child to boot, double whammy, but I at least have a little brains and some luck, which I kind of use on a day-to-day basis. Due to my parents' connections, I managed to get into a lucrative school in my country, did my military service, and was promoted upward to captain and later on was shipped off to college out of country. I've never been too close with many people apart from my circle of friends, and I prefer it that way. After my college, I was employed in government, you guessed it, family connections, and after a few years, was able to use my name to get ahead and meet people, who helped me set up several businesses in my area, a coastal city, where this story happens. The money I used was generally allowances, small inheritance from my late grandma, some investments a fund that was started when I was a baby, and money gifted to me by family, basically in an attempt to not leave me broke enough to embarrass them, even though I am a simple low-maintenance fellow. My businesses are booming, since the coastal area we live in attracts a lot of tourists, local and international, and of course some locals who wish to mingle with the tourists to get green cards, pen pals, spouses and such. Typical coastal city, I guess. The incident... As a proprietor of my business, I have most if not all of my staff on salary since it's the best way for them to gain benefits and is easier for me as a business owner tax-wise. Tipping's more of a gift typically since we don't have a tipping culture and I have my staff on comprehensive medical insurance which has additional dental and optical on top of the national governmental healthcare medical scheme. Our government hospitals provide all services free, but wait times for elective surgeries are exhausting. We also have a mandatory legal requirement to provide employees with retirement benefit savings. A minimum of 21 working days leave, I give 30, and my business offers paid overtime and unhindered medical leave for surgery in serious conditions, which can be extended, as well as allowances to seek treatment such as chemo or dialysis. One of my female employees, an older lady who is brilliant and had moved up the ranks to manager and was adored by all, was booked for a hysterectomy since, as she told me, she was at risk of cervical cancer as her mother had passed from it a few years back. And since she already had four kids, it was the most logical step. She did her due diligence and found a private hospital, which was in our system, where she could have the procedure done. On the planned date, she applied for leave days, which we obviously rejected, since this fell under the scope of medical leave. She went on to have the procedure successfully and had a quick recovery time. The bill was to be catered for by the company insurance, and we'd made sure to get all the necessary pre-authorizations. A few months later, she came into work looking distraught, and in all honesty, we thought that she'd been told that she'd gotten cancer since she asked for a day off to go for review and tests. But what happened was much worse. She'd been given a bill by the hospital since the insurance had refused to pay for it, citing that it was not in the scope of cover. We were livid since we had to make sure everything was in freaking order. I sent my accounts manager to go have a talk with the insurance people as we tried to calm her down. The manager came back super angry and told me that basically after showing them the evidence, the insurance people just told them to buzz off. I decided to personally go visit that office and get a clear understanding of what was happening. They kept me waiting for an hour and even after that had the audacity to inform me the director from the head office who was in the area had declined to meet me because he was quote unquote busy. I was pissed to the high heavens. So I decided to go to their head office in the capital city, a two hour flight. The head office was no help and informed me that they'd revised their policy and that it was not covered. I asked when the policy was revised. They informed me a month prior. I informed them the surgery was done five months prior and we had all the documentations. They claimed that it was 12 months retrospective. I inquired why I was not informed of it since this was big news and I've held policies with them and they told me that they'd informed their large clients and would inform the other clients when their insurances were due for renewal. I demanded to speak to their boss, company vice president, since the CEO was not around, and they boldly told me that he had no time for me and frankly that, in verbatim, we are a large company and have no time to argue semantics with low-end clients. If you don't like it, you can frankly leave and find a new insurance company. The revenge 
If I'd been initially pissed, I was full-blown mad. I was livid and filled with rage. In all my years, I may have experienced some disrespect, and I accepted it to not make problems, but this time it went too far. I decided in the heat of the moment to switch everything and be done with them. I flew back home and just plain went to the hospital to settle the bill in full and took the receipt to my employee, who initially insisted that she would do anything to pay me back, but I refused since it was no way her fault and I'll be darned if she pays for something that was way out of her control. I had a few days to cool down and talk with my directors. The words still etched on my mind. I asked how long it would take us to switch to another insurance. They went ahead and checked out a few large rivals of the insurance we had and discovered that if we switched, it would take six months for the new insurance to provide full coverage. The firm we picked, who I'll call New Insurance, offered us a way better deal to the one we had. And not only comprehensive cover, dental and optical, they also included mental health cover, physiotherapy and occupational therapy cover, rehabilitative services, mobility device acquisition, prosthetics and wheelchairs for some of the disabled employees, smart cards for direct payment on outpatient visits, kind of like a debit card, a dedicated team of relationship managers, death and funeral benefits, and an expanded coverage area, plus up to six dependents plus spouse cover. It would cost me a little more, but I didn't really care. The people who dealt with us from our previous insurance, who I'll call old insurance, seemed unfazed that I was pulling my company from them since they thought it was just a small business. They looked puzzled when I came in with several people and a few boxes of documents. What they failed to realize was that apart from that one business which is a restaurant, I have three popular bars, a cab company, a hotel resort, cleaning service chain, a building and residential guard service, and several rental buildings in the town and around the country. Their shock was compounded when they were informed by the lawyer just who I am, and the shock, awe, confusion, and panic when they heard my family name was an extremely satisfying sight. Cue the pleading and attempted negotiations and apologies. It was so big that the news reached their head office who sent not only their director, the one who was apparently too big to see me, but also their chief legal officer, chief financial officer, and president of the company. I also somehow earned a personalized call from their CEO who was abroad. No amount of sweet talking was changing my mind, and by the end of the six weeks, we'd completely removed ourselves from the old insurance. It was now a waiting game to the beginning of the new insurance cover, and we really, really hoped that no one would become unwell by that time, but we were ready just in case. In that time waiting, and after the new insurance commenced, I talked to my friends and my family on one of my holiday visits. My older brother's kids adore me and my family kind of realized they were jerks to me and are trying to re-enter my life and thought that was that. Aftermath, my friends and family took my words and also pulled their businesses from the insurance to other insurances. The company took such a huge hit and when COVID came around and was a big deal, they were barely floating. They went into receivership soon after and were acquired by the insurance I'd moved to, who happened to be their greatest rivals. The directors and CEO were given their golden parachutes and resigned, and most of their employees were luckily retained apart from these senior executives, including the ones who told my manager to buzz off. In a cruel twist of irony, the building they were operating on in our town was sold. And if you guessed I purchased it, you would be absolutely correct. I decided to remodel the inside and turn it into a business rental space. All in all, it was a bit of sweet payback and wherever they are, I hope those disrespectful guys learned that everyone is human and they're not above anyone. And remember that karma is a cold and heartless witch. Incredible respect to OP in this story. Not only did they display that as somebody that owns a lot of businesses and is, by all appearances, very successful, but they displayed that they put their employees first. Going out of their way to pay for that lady's hysterectomy when she wouldn't get coverage, standing up for the employees underneath them, making sure that employees have good insurance that actually covers the things that they're going to run into and face. I've had relatives who have insurance through their work, and somehow these insurance companies managed to deny claims and 
One hospital trip still gets you stuck with thousands of dollars in bills. It's just mind-boggling and crazy and so frustrating. So it's nice to hear a story of somebody out there fighting for good insurance and protecting the people that work for them. But first, a story from Alberti. HOA rules need to be followed? Sure. The setup. Our tales begin in my teen years about 10 to 11 years ago. It was summer and my parents wanted to go on vacation. Me being a 16 year old idiot with both a gaming addiction and seeing my cue to living the free, independent, unsupervised life, much like a house cat with an open door for two weeks opportunity, offered to house and dog sit while they and my sister went on vacation. Some important background information is probably needed here, since else some idiots here might call my parents neglectful for leaving a 16 year old unsupervised for two weeks. I'm from a way safer and secure place than the US. We lived in the suburb and I was taught most life skills by the time I was 12. The only dangers I could be exposed to would be alcohol poisoning and strains to my wrist from the insane amount of rounds I would force my poor member through during the two weeks. You know, the typical threats for a boy in a country in which 16 year olds can buy beer. The boy and the Karen Megasaurus Rex. Week 1. While gaming took 90% of my time away, and I developed the day and night schedule of a back-end developer, I still did all the chores around the house, with a few exceptions since I deemed they could wait. I checked the mailbox and there's a handwritten letter with runes of the ancient. Using my old doctor's notes as a Rosetta Stone, I deciphered that it was from the president of our equivalent of an HOA. Imagine an HOA with a fifth of the power the typical HOA in the US would have. A Hawkeye of the HOA Avengers. If it was a sport, it would only receive participation awards. You get the point. The Moria written tomb said that the grass of my front lawn was too tall according to regulations. I went out, took a look at the grass, which was maybe one centimeter too tall. That's the equivalent of a jelly bean to my freedom measurement, folks. Same day, I cut the grass, cause might as well do so to keep the peace. The day after, a new letter written by the same Shakespeare wannabe came. I grabbed my Indiana Jones hat and performed a heathen ritual in the shed to read the message. The roses in my front yard were going too far out through the fence by 15 centimeters. That's an average sized carrot in Murakana. I once again comply. On the third day of crapmas, the true cause of annoyance said to me, my backyard's bushes were too tall. Here's where I finally get irritated since you have to enter my parents' property to check the bush's height. With Satan's three commandments in hand, I go and visit my direct neighbor, who I knew were in the HOA board. I ask her about the gutter speak letters and she looks through them and laughs. Those are from the Banshee of Arrakis, aka the Mega Karen, who lived ten houses further down the street. She'd been kicked out of the HOA board after she poisoned three dogs in the neighborhood with rat poison laced treats. Not wanting to deal with her after she threw rocks at me when I was trick or treating as a child, I decided to let the case rest and leave my bushes be untrimmed. The boy, the planted bomb, and the instigation. Fast forward a week into my parents' vacation, after being alone for seven days, I finally mastered the art of playing Mozart's Requiem on the meat flute and decided to do something else. As any teenager would, I started to plan a party, and like the good kid I was, I went around to all my nearby neighbors and warned them about the potential noise, which parties tend to create. At some point here, in my post-flute clarity, I remembered the saying, witches be fading but a good counter-strike match lasts forever. Instead of holding a straight up party, I decided to invite friends over to a LAN party so we could play Counter-Strike Source and quickly replace the white blood cells in our body with whatever was in the knockoff energy drinks. Fast forward to said LAN party, my parents dining room smells like teenage farts, axe body spray, sweat and all the chips in the world mixed together. Typical LAN stuff, 1am there's a loud knock on the door. I go out to see two cops looking at me with a surprised Pikachu face. I look at them with the same amount of confusion. Cop 1 says, we have a report that there's a loud party going on and there might be several minors doing drugs here. I say, does energy drinks count as drugs? Cop 2 says, no. I say, then I have no idea what you're talking about. Cop 1 says, we had a frantic woman calling constantly, which is why we came, but it seems we're more of a disturbance than you guys are. At the same time, one of my friends can be heard in the background. OP, get in here, the bomb's been planted and you're the only one alive. Cop 1 says, Counter-Strike? I say, Counter-Strike. 
They say we'll leave you to it then. Cop left, and we lost the match. Unrelated though. Two days after, I get another knock on my door. There she is, the bane of all good, she who must not be mentioned without carrying Marak's sword and a towel on you. She starts screaming that me and my drug party kept her up all night, and that I'm a horrible brat who needed to tend to my bushes if my parents don't want to lose the house. At this point I stop her and remind her that 1. The HOA doesn't have the power to do that. They hardly have the power to do anything except approve of the house owner's requests. 2. That she was kicked out of the HOA due to the poison incident. 3. That I didn't even have a party. 4. That she needs to stay the freak away from my backyard. She got even madder and started screaming that she would have me and my parents arrested, and that the poison treats were meant for my dog as well. I slammed the door on her faster than hyperspacing from Argos Row. She had royally pissed me off. No one threatens my good boy. No one. Perfect legal pettiness. So now we're at our final act, my revenge. I had about four days before my parents returned, so I made them count. I called the police and visited my real HOA neighbor and got all the necessary approvals. Then I went over and talked with the neighbors surrounding her house. I would do all the yard work which involved loud equipment around her house. Legally, we were allowed to make noise from 8am till 8pm with yard work, but it's considered rude to do it after 5pm. That didn't stop me though. Like a druid on Paragon level 256, I just kept sending leaves and grass flying, as if all the bushes, trees, and odd plants had pissed on my grandfather's ashes. She came out and screamed at me, even threw a rock at me. It brought back old memories, but I didn't care. I was going to make as much legal sound as possible. Whenever she complained, I just told her that her plants weren't up to HOA standard. Friday rolls around, it's 8am. Me and my friends are gathered in front of her house. We have all the tools ready, purchased by the blood coin of my insanity-induced labor the two days prior. It's time to make her pay. We turn on the speaker, the barbecue, and crack up a beer. Speaker is set to the exact legal limit of how loud the music is allowed to be. Most of her neighbors come out and join during the day, since I'd invited them while kill billing their plants. She screamed constantly for an hour, called the cops twice, which left after seeing my permits from themselves and the HOA. That's right, witch. If you want a party to complain about, then you shall get the finest party of the Shire just outside of your house. We kept it up to the exact time limit. Although OP's revenge here is really, really good, would you guys agree that this revenge and this agitation that OP's causing them is probably not a good thing? Just because it only serves to motivate the neighbor to try to get back at them however they can? Or do you think what OP did was great and if anything they should do more of it? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is from Civil Contribution 48 My downstairs neighbor better be ready. Okay, so background info. I, 31 year old female, live on the ground floor, Europe. And my downstairs neighbor basically lives in the basement of this building. From my entrance, it's the basement, but she, 60 plus, has ground level entry to her apartment. The building's from the 50s, so I realize that at times some noise from the neighbors is expected, and generally I don't care about it. For instance, my next door neighbor often has family over in the weekend, and I don't care about that. But my downstairs neighbor is so freaking loud when she's out in her atrium. I've lived here for almost three years, and sure as heck, every single sunny day she has guests over in her atrium, and they're so loud that I can't use my balcony, and sometimes they're even that loud, that I can hear them through the closed balcony door, from the morning to the late afternoon slash evening. I guess she retired early and I'm on disability working limited hours. She sometimes even invites someone over so they can use her atrium to fix their motorbike, completely ignoring that this is a neighborhood with several multi-story apartment complexes close to each other's, amplifying any kind of noise. She also thinks everything happening in the neighborhood is of her business and makes sure to comment loudly on everything going on outside of her atrium. It's right next to the parking lot and common areas. So today I went and did something good for our environment and to get back on her. I brought a bug hotel and bug friendly seeds for my flower box for my balcony so she better be prepared for some visitors this spring slash summer. I suppose it definitely depends on what kind of neighbor you've got, but it might be worth mentioning your concerns to them, 
If anything, at least it'll make you feel better if they're a jerk about it that you get those bees flying around in the area. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every single video has great stories like our next one from Nabs91, Reverse Petty Revenge, drive through Drama. Yesterday, I was in the drive through at my local McDonald's. The individual in front of me wouldn't move up to the speaker, although there was room. I beeped and motioned for him to move up. He looked up, smiled, and gave me the finger. He made his order and went through. When I went to window one, the employee said that he paid for my order. He pulled through window two and before he left, flipped me off again. I approached window two and the other employee asked if I was with him. I said no and she said that he had said that I was and she gave him my order because of that and because he paid. So all in all, this guy was so mad that I beeped at him, he paid for his order and an additional $25 for my order just to mildly inconvenience me. This was a new level of petty I haven't experienced before. I've definitely heard of this kind of petty revenge before, but I think they didn't do it as smoothly as possible. The goal definitely would have been to like make OP understand that they paid it forward or something, so that by the time they pulled up to window 2 and they found out that they took the food with them and left, it would be some kind of like very big like, oh that guy's just a huge jerk kind of moment. Basically, the moral of the story here is, if you get up to window one and they say that they paid for your order, you tell that person in the window, okay great, just make sure they don't hand them my order. Our next story is from Beer and Food Make the Weekend, was petty over mere pennies. Several years ago, I used to volunteer part-time at a pretty well-known British charity shop. This happened soon after the UK government legislation, where shops had to start charging for single-use plastic bags, like five pence at the time. The idea was to try and cut down on plastic. Most customers were either fine with paying or even started bringing their own bags. But there was this one guy that decided to take the piss. So this guy comes into the shop to browse around for a bit before coming to the till with some form of clothing, can't remember what. I'm scanning his item and he asks for a bag. I tell the guy we have to charge for bags now and that it's five pence per bag, something I make sure to tell every customer. The conversation between me and the guy isn't word for word, but it's more or less how it went. I say it's five pence for a bag, is that okay? I say, oh, no need, I'll just use one of these. Now, one other thing the charity shop offers is donation bags, little packets that contain a large bag. Basically, if anyone wanted to donate items to the shop, we would give them a few of these packets, and they could either bring back the filled bags themselves, or arrange with the shop for the items to be picked up. After refusing the bag, the guy reaches for a donation bag. I say, oh, those are for donations only. The guy interrupts me, wearing this poop-eating grin as he opens the packet. But why should I have to pay for a bag when these ones are free? I say, it's company policy. You have to pay for plastic bags now. The guy says, but these ones are free. The whole situation was starting to piss me off now, and I'd already dealt with some other crappy customers earlier that day, so I stopped caring at this moment and just let him use the donation bag. On the Till's computer screen, we had a add bag button installed that'll add 5 pence to the total bill. Maintaining eye contact, I reached over, said, one sec, then tapped the button and charged him the extra 5 pence. The guy either didn't care or probably didn't notice, but at the time, that was the most pettiest thing I remember doing. Such a small thing, but it made my crappy shift much better. As long as you're not going to get in trouble for it and get caught over it, I think it's pretty fair to charge that jerk five pence for being as much of a jerk as they were being. Would you guys agree that it's a good thing to have a charge for plastic bags? Let me know what you guys think. Our next story is from Tiefschlag. Try to stop me, Jehovah's Witness. A long time ago, when I was about 13, my parents lived in a big apartment block, at least for our country standards in the 80s, and every summer it was the same. My parents went to work, and I enjoyed the time I had for myself. Insert self-enjoyment joke here. Back then, my very special friends, the Jehovah's Witnesses, used to go from door to door to talk to you about God. Unlike when you see them standing in the street, they would never shut up and take an enormous amount of your time basically trying to brainwash you in about half an hour. My parents warned me about them ahead of time and told me not to open the door when they came knocking. God alone knows how they got in the building. So during summer break, my usual routine as a bit of an introvert teen was to get up late, have breakfast, 
and then either switch on my computer or play the five finger shuffle and sometimes both. Now imagine how helpful to my agenda a knock on the door and the words, excuse me, do you want to talk about God was while I'm in the middle of another round of spank the monkey? When it happens once, no biggie, just be quiet and wait for them to go away. But when it happens every freaking day, it starts to piss you off, royally. I swear these guys must have a self-enjoyment sensor or something. One day I decided to dodge the issue altogether and try to get out for a change. Why not get some fresh air? Being the smart kid I was, I decided to use the stairs because I was dead sure that my special friends would use the elevator to make their rounds. Oh, how wrong I was. Just as I entered the stairwell, along came two guys in their 30s looking exactly like I imagined them. Horn-rimmed glasses, short-sleeved shirts with ties. Classy. Here we go, I thought, trying to avoid any interaction. I wanted to avoid eye contact and squeeze myself past them. Well, I tried. Hello, young man. Do you have a minute to talk about God? No, sorry. I'm in a bit of a hurry. Excuse me. As I tried to get past, one of them made a big mistake, saying, Hey, wait! And he grabbed my wrist. Yes, I was an introvert teen, but not only A, I was pissed off. Really pissed off. No one messes with my happy time. B, I've been a martial artist since I could walk. Won the regional tournament the year before. Reacting before I could think, I twisted his hand to his back and added a kick to the back of the knee for good measure. Let's just say it did the job it was supposed to do. Far be it from me to say that I felt the sweet joy of payback in that moment. That would be unethical. But the grin on my face spoke volumes. As an added bonus, for some reason they seemed to lose interest in my building soon after. Turned out to be a great summer. Realistically, this is one big lesson about not putting your hands on somebody else. As far as the legality of this situation, I'd say OP was completely in the right because if you're trying to leave and somebody grabs your wrist, a little bit of fairly innocent self-defense I think is more than warranted. Whether or not it was a Jehovah's Witness. This next story is from AKSNITD. I'm sorry, what year is it? Here's another story from my work with databases. One of the many data tables that I dealt with was refreshed on a weekly basis. Then when the year ended, we'd freeze the data. That meant we would stop refreshing the data, rename the table from data table to data table 2010 or insert the proper year, and create a new empty table called data table that takes place for the current year. This is because very often the number of columns would change from year to year, and even the logic would change. So something that was being calculated one way would be calculated differently using the new columns that had been added. There weren't new columns every year, but the logic was always changed. Along comes yet another know-it-all, Harry. Harry's the stereotypical boss who knows little, but is only too happy to take credit. I'd been working on the updates for the new year. These updates would usually take around two months since they would come in, be worked on, and it'd be an iterative process. We'd go back and forth on ambiguities, issues with bad data, exceptional cases, and other assorted problems. So for two months, the code was in flux, and everyone knew there may be incorrect values because of this. Harry was having none of this. He wanted everything done tomorrow. Naturally, he was bugging me to get the updates done quickly. None of this two-month nonsense, even though it worked and was a proven system over many years. I ended up working overtime and delivered it in about a month. What did I get for my labor? One lousy thank you email which wasn't even copied to any of the seniors. So my work wasn't even openly acknowledged. And as an added bonus, Harry would be presenting this on call to the people in charge. You can probably guess where this is going. Day of call, Harry pings me and reminds me to have everything ready. Of course, I created this setup. I know it inside out. We get on the call, and Harry's going on and on about how great this table is, blah blah blah. I'm inwardly laughing because, to be honest, the yearly updates weren't that big this time and even then, it's still an improvement of something we've had for a while. It's not something completely new, but clearly Harry's decided this will be his big thing. After all this blabber, he goes to run the report, and what would you know, it's showing last year's information. All the numbers are off because of that. 
Rather flustered, he tries to brush it off, claiming the report needs to be updated with the latest data, and asks me to refresh the process. I run it, and he tries again. No change. Yes, I had made it point to the frozen data of the previous year on the back end. After half a dozen tries with nothing changing, Harry gives up, admits defeat, and closes the call. Needless to say, this blew up in his face and he was reassigned elsewhere. There were a bunch of frantic emails over how to fix this urgent problem. I let everyone stew over it for a week before going in and undoing my changes, which took about five minutes. I still didn't get as much credit as I felt I deserved for delivering the updates early, but I at least got this monkey off my back, and that was enough. If I found myself an OP situation where there was a crappy boss that wanted to take credit for what I did, or at least present it in a way that heavily assumes that they're the one really responsible for this and be like, look at this shiny new tool that I was the driving force for, then yeah, I'd feel the same way as OP and I'd want to expose them too, and I'd want a little credit myself as well, especially when you work so much overtime on that. Our next story is from Pokey1984, Accidental Revenge on a Wrong Number Caller. I haven't had a cell phone in a number of years. About 2015, I got a shiny new job with a good pay boost, and so I went out and bought a shiny new phone. Naturally, I also got a new number with the phone. All was well with my first ever smartphone. The one before that was a slider, that's how long I'd been without a cell phone. That I've never had a smartphone before is relevant later in my story. Well, it was great for about a month. Then the voicemail started. Phones weren't allowed inside the building where I worked for security reasons, so I checked my messages after work. And every day there was a message on my phone, sometimes two or three. Hi Deborah, this is Jen from hospital. I really need you to come in on Saturday. Please give me a call back. Except, I guess she assumed Deborah had her number because she didn't leave it, and the callback number captured by my phone was just the hospital switchboard. Every day there was a new message. Hi, Deborah. The patient in 2B has asked for you. Call me. Hi, Deborah. It's Jen. I need you on the third floor on Tuesday. I know that's your day in the East Wing, but we've got a patient coming in who needs so-and-so. Never a last name or a callback number, just friendly, chatty messages. I tried calling the switchboard. They agreed I shouldn't be getting those calls, but couldn't think of a way to track down who Jen or Deborah were due to the sheer size of the hospital and not knowing even what department they worked in. After the third or fourth time I called, they promised to pass a memo reminding staff to double check their address books and make sure to leave a name and a callback number with every message. But the voicemails kept coming, and since Jen only ever called while I was in work, I could never catch her to tell her to stop calling me. And she apparently missed the memo about requiring full names and callback numbers on every message. I even changed my outgoing message to say, If you're looking for Deborah, you have a wrong number. This is OP Cell. If you have a message for Deborah, hang up. If you have one for me, leave it at the tone. Despite this, the messages continued. So the important part about this being my very first smartphone was that I was trying out all kinds of apps. I even paid a monthly fee to have one that transcribed all my voicemails so I could read them instead of hear them. After a few months of annoying voicemails, I started saving those message transcripts. I collected over 50 of them in a six week period. To this day, I have no idea how Jen didn't know Deborah wasn't getting her messages. They clearly saw each other face to face several times a week at least. One would think that Jen would have asked Deborah why she never returned her calls, or Deborah would be confused when Jen mentioned she'd left a message, but somehow neither of them noticed and I kept getting the calls. Then one day, I had an unexpected afternoon off work during business hours, so I decided to go down to the hospital and track down either Jen or her boss. I just wanted the calls to stop, so I went to the hospital and explained my problem and showed the receptionist my list of transcribed calls. She looked at them for a really long time and eventually gave me back the phone, told me, don't delete those, just wait here a moment, I'll be right back. She gave me back my phone while emphasizing the don't delete those part. I waited. Bored, I started reading the messages on the nearby bulletin board. One was a memo reminding staff and patients alike to always leave a full name and callback number when leaving voicemail messages. So the switchboard made good on their promise at least. It was half covered by a flyer for an upcoming golf tournament, so clearly no one was paying much attention to it, but they tried. The receptionist came back with a gentleman in a suit. 
who was very friendly and apologized for the trouble, but asked to see the messages. So I handed over my phone again. He looked increasingly concerned as he scrolled through them. Then he thanked me for my patience and for bringing this to his attention, and would I mind waiting here for just a little longer? It's very important. See, I hadn't actually read all those voicemails. I developed a habit of seeing the Hi Debra and automatically hitting Save to the file I'd made for them. I just wanted the list of messages to show how very many I was getting, so they'd take me seriously that there was an excessive number. And I guess I hope they could use some of those messages to figure out who the heck Jen was and get her to update her contacts. Five minutes later, me and my list of voicemails were in the hospital administrator's office with four dudes in suits and the receptionist. I told my story the third time and was asked again to show them the messages. Then the room got very quiet. Then the administrator and the four men in suits started whispering. After a few moments, the administrator whispered something to the receptionist who went wide-eyed and answered, right away, in an urgent tone before rushing from the room so fast that she actually lost a shoe and had to back up and put it back on. I swear for a minute I thought I'd stumbled into a medical drama on the TV. That's a serious violation, one suit says in an almost normal voice. We could get sued. Another whispers back a little too loud. I didn't catch most of what they were saying, but caught a few bits about HIPAA and patient privacy. Then I actually started reading the transcripts. Jen had named names, diagnosis, and treatments, and even asked about specific files and included patient ID numbers and such. There weren't a lot of calls with specific info, but there were several in the list of generic, I need you on Tuesday messages. There was some more whispering from the group, And then one of the suits said to the administrator, you can't keep her here after this, the privacy violations alone. And the administrator cut him off with a fierce shake of her head and a stony look on her face. Oh no, I'm firing her right now. I've already sent security to escort her here. Oh, so that's where the receptionist went in such a hurry. About that time, they all seemed to remember that I was in the room, at which point the suits left in a rush throwing a good bit of legal jargon back and forth at each other. I assume they were all lawyers. Then the administrator sat down and kindly explained to me that what Jen had done was very illegal, in addition to being rude. She also very politely asked me if she could copy those messages, and implied they might be subpoenaed if I didn't let her, and would I be willing to testify in court about these calls if they needed me to. And of course, the hospital would pay any relevant costs if I needed to testify, And we're very sorry that this happened. We very much appreciate you bringing this to our attention. You've done a great service to all the patients in this hospital. She really laid that part on kind of thick. The tech department walked off with my phone for a bit, and I filled out some paperwork one of the suits brought in with my info and signed a witness statement about the calls they were making copies of, and another agreeing to testify if they needed it, and one saying that I understood testifying was voluntary and I could decline to testify any time by filling out another form, and a form agreeing that I would remove those messages from my phone and not distribute them. The whole visit kind of became a blur, and it wasn't until I was being thanked for my help and escorted out to my car that I really realized what had happened and that this was a big freaking deal. I had just wanted the voicemails to stop, but I ended up getting a department head fired. In the end, I spent less than 45 minutes in the hospital altogether. I never got another voicemail for Deborah, and I was never asked to testify. About three months later, I got a generic form letter in the mail from the hospital legal department apologizing for the data leak and assuring me that no patient information had been disseminated to the public and that the responsible parties had been released from employment by the hospital. Since I'd never been a patient there, I assume my name was just tacked onto the list of parties involved along with all of Jen's patients. No word on what, if anything, happened to Deborah. I'm gonna be willing to bet that Deborah definitely got blackballed from working in that environment. At least they sure as heck aren't going to get a recommendation. I'm wondering what if any legal action might have been done. Guess we'll never really know. And our final story of the day is by Ha 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 Thunk. Greedy grabbers get exactly what they take. Sweet older lady in our church was a retired nurse, never married, no kids. She had a heart attack and while she was in the hospital, her niece and nephew thought she was dying. They came and took her stuff. 
Her apartment was small, but she had some very nice crystal and silver and some lovely antique furniture. When she came home, she had no dishes and almost no furniture. Niece and nephew denied it, but the neighbors had seen them carting everything away. Several years later, she passed away. Her most recent will, dated after her heart attack, left one dollar to each her niece and nephew. Everything else went to the church. Her estate was nine million dollars. Well, stealing from somebody is definitely a very good way to make sure that you don't end up on their will in the end. That niece and nephew got exactly what they deserved. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.